waste for New York City by 2030. Getting to zero waste in New York City is an important and extremely ambitious goal. The plan outlines several initiatives, including expanding organics, enhancing curbside recycling, reducing the use of non-compostable waste like plastic bags, giving all New Yorkers the opportunity to reduce waste, making all schools zero waste, expanding e-waste and textile recycling, developing a save-as-you-throw program, and reducing commercial waste by 90% by 2030. I greatly appreciate the hard work of the Department of Sanitation, and I've seen progress in several of these initiatives, but there is still so much work left to do. I'm looking forward to understanding the benchmarks that we are hitting for these initiatives, what measurable goals are in place to ensure that we are staying on track, and the plans to improve our progress along the way. I'm especially interested in learning about the progress being made to reduce commercial waste and how those reductions are being tracked. I look forward to hearing testimony from DSNY, the environmental advocates, and other interested groups about their experience with these initiatives so far and any advice that they have for how the city could be doing more to reduce waste. Um, and now, all right, and I want to just mention that we are joined by Sanitation Committee member from, oh, thank you, Ben. But we're waiting for Council Member Ben Kalos, who will speak on his bill in a couple of seconds. But we are joined by Committee Member Stephen Matteo from Staten Island. So he's going to, do you want to? I'll be quick. Good afternoon. I want to thank the uh, Senate Sanitation Committee Chair, Antonio Reynoso, for having this important hearing. And uh, Commissioner Garcia, though we may disagree, may, though I may disagree with both of you, about siting of certain stations. I want to uh, thank both of you for your partnership on reducing waste, increasing diversion. Uh, when I ran for city council in 2013, uh, everyone in my district was opposed to a marine transfer station, but I suggested that we were arguing about the right th wrong thing when we had an opportunity to really have a broader conversation about uh, what we did with waste in our city, and uh, I suggested that we could head towards zero waste, uh, which is something that the uh, mayor has set as a city policy, and so I was uh, proud to introduce legislation that would actually require it, as we've learned from the federal administration. Uh, sometimes executive orders can be changed, especially with changes in administration, and uh, laws are a lot harder to do, especially as we see on the federal level. So I want to thank the uh, committee chair for prioritizing and hearing this legislation, and uh, hopefully this can help reduce the burden of protressable waste uh, through, for districts throughout our city. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. And now we are joined by Bridget Anderson, the Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability of the Department of Sanitation, and the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation, D. Catherine Garcia. Good afternoon, Chair Renoso and members of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of the Department of Sanitation. With me here to answer your questions is Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability for the Department. As Commissioner of the Agency responsible for developing and managing the most ambitious and comprehensive sustainable solid waste management program of any city in the nation, I welcome this opportunity to share with you our experiences, observations, and progress to date in achieving this administration's goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. My testimony today will highlight just a few of the many aspects of the city's zero waste initiatives, but this is fundamentally about how we as a city view our waste. It can be and is a valuable resource. It is especially fitting to mention that today is the beginning of Climate Week 2017, 
a time when cities across our nation and the globe are coming together to raise awareness and inspire action on climate change. Waste management, including both solid waste and wastewater treatment, accounts for 4% of citywide greenhouse gas emissions, and achieving zero waste to landfills is a key part of the city's 80 by 50 commitment. Management of New York City's solid waste has evolved considerably over the last three decades. By the 1980s, New York City came to symbolize the modern garbage crisis, with a growing volume of waste and declining options available for in-city disposal. By this time, the Fresh Kills landfill had become the largest municipal landfill in the country, and the city's incinerators burned garbage with few of the environmental controls of today's energy from waste facilities. Over time, the city improved its waste management operations by closing its outdated incinerators and landfills, and in 1989, the city created the nation's largest municipal residential program. At the time, New York City became the only major city to collect recyclables at the curbside from all residents, regardless of building size. The 2006 Solid Waste Management Plan was a landmark achievement for long-term waste planning and environmental justice. The plan was designed to reduce the city's reliance on a network of land-based transfer stations and long-haul trucking to export residential waste by switching to an equ equitable framework of marine and rail transfer stations located in all five boroughs. Two weeks ago, the department opened the Hamilton Avenue Marine Transfer Station in Brooklyn, the second of the four MTSs that will open under this administration. We are working to bring the remaining marine transfer stations on board over the next two years. When the final marine transfer stations are opened, we will have reduced truck travel associated with waste export by more than 60 million miles per year, including more than 5 million miles in and around New York City. The New York City Department of Sanitation collects more than 3.5 million tons of waste and recyclables each year. Last year, we collected 3.2 million tons of waste for disposal and another 640,000 tons of recyclables and organics. Since 2005, the amount of refuse collected by DSNY has decreased by 12 percent, while the city's population increased by 6 percent. As a result, the average New Yorker today throws out an average of 14 pounds of garbage at home each week, lower than or on par with other cities across the country, even those on the West Coast. The amount of waste is not the only thing that has changed over time. I just want to bring your, you'll notice the two pie charts. To understand what New Yorkers throw out, the department regularly completes waste characterization studies. A comprehensive residential study was conducted in 2005 and updated in 2013, and we are currently in the process of it again. The results of this year's study will be published in early 2018. These studies give us valuable information about how well New Yorkers are recycling and help us identify realistic opportunities to divert other material from disposal. These studies have shown that rapidly changing nature of our waste stream over time, and they have reaffirmed trends that the rest of the nation is experiencing. In the last decade, the amount of overall waste has decreased due to, uh, to changes in what people are throwing out. The volume of paper and newsprint has declined significantly, and early results will say that it has declined even more in the 2017 waste characterization as a result of the growth of the digital economy. Many manufacturers are eliminating glass containers, more costly to transport and prone to breakage, in favor of rigid plastic containers, which the city added to the curbside recycling program in 2013. As we look forward, we expect economic and social trends to continue to influence what is in our waste and the nature and scope of the programs we must develop to sustainably manage it. The waste characterization study shows us that our waste should be viewed as a resource from which we can extract value, energy, nutrients, and new products. Today we recycle more than 20 percent of our waste. We are moving in the right direction and achieving <coughs> positive change compared to just a decade ago. But we know New Yorkers and the department can do more. The department has developed a set of interrelated initiatives that together create a roadmap to, meet, to meeting our goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. 
We have already taken great steps to implement these initiatives, many at a scale and scope unparalleled in the United States, and in some cases, the world. With a coordinated effort, we can, as a city, eliminate the need to send our waste to landfills, and we will minimize the overall environmental impact of our trash. At Sanitation, we take our role as heralds of this movement very seriously. And in the last several years, we have already put in place transformative expansions to the services we offer New Yorkers and the infrastructure to handle it. And we will continue to aggressively on this path. But we also know that full realization of the city's vision is going to require all hands on deck. Change may not be linear, and growth of programs is not instantaneous. <coughs> But with the full backing of the City Council and of New Yorkers, we are confident that the approaches we are pursuing, as I will outline below, will result in significant step changes over the next 13 years to get us to our collective goal. For much of the 20th century, the Department of Sanitation primarily engaged in the carefully choreographed art of collecting and disposing of whatever New Yorkers decided to throw away. Today, however, we know that a way does not exist. Our greatest ability to influence New Yorkers' path towards zero waste, though, lies in the curbside collection and drop-off programs that divert waste from landfills for beneficial use. As I mentioned earlier, the city has had a mandatory curbside recycling program for more than 25 years. Today we are collecting more recyclables than at any point in the last decade, and we are the only major city in the United States that collects recyclables in two streams, commingled paper, and separately, metal, glass, plastic, and cartons. Advances in sorting and recycling technology have now made it both feasible and economical to separate mixed material into high-value commodity bales. The department is currently working with our recycling processing vendor, Sims Municipal Recycling, to develop a plan to retrofit the city's recycling system to accept single-stream recycling starting in 2020. This will make it easier for New Yorkers to recycle and will allow us to more efficiently collect recyclable materials. Food scraps, yard waste, and food soil paper suitable for composting, also known as organics, make up one-third of the city's residential waste stream. In 2013, the city began a pilot curbside organics collection program on Staten Island. Today, the program serves nearly 570,000 households in over 800 schools across the city, and by the end of this year, nearly 3.3 million New Yorkers will have regular DSNY curbside organics collection service. No other city provides a curbside organics service that is operated on such a large scale as New York City's program. By the end of next year, New York City Organics will serve all New Yorkers with either curbside collection service or convenient neighborhood drop-off sites. From the beginning of our voluntary organics pilot to today, we have collected more than 55,000 tons of organics from participating households, schools, and agencies. In 2011, the city launched Refashion NYC, a partnership with Housing Works, to place clothing recycling bins in apartment buildings at no cost to the city. Today, nearly 1,500 buildings with 146,000 individual households participate in the program. As clothing and textiles make up 6% of the residential waste, we continue to work with our partners to expand opportunities and convenience to donate, reuse, and recycle these items. We support efforts by Grow NYC to offer weekly clothing collections at green markets and to host community-scale clothing donation and stop-and-swap events citywide. Last fiscal year, we collected and reused or recycled more than 14,500 tons of clothing and textiles through these programs. Although it comprises less than 1% of the waste stream, electronic waste often contains toxic materials like mercury, cadmium, lead, and other heavy metals. In order to prevent these materials from polluting the environment upon disposal, the department has developed several options for residents to properly recycle e-waste. The East E-Cycle NYC program, developed at no cost to the city in partnership with ERI, has grown to be the most expansive and convenient e-waste collection program in the country, serving more than 12,500 apartment buildings with nearly 800,000 households and 2 million residents. We have also added on-demand e-waste collection service for residents of the outer boroughs, expanding next month to northern Brooklyn. 
The department also continues its popular safe disposal program, offering five permanent drop-off sites and 10 borough-wide safe disposal events per year, plus smaller pop-up events hosted by community partners. In 2015, New York State banned the collection of electronics for disposal, which has helped to dramatically grow the participation in each of our e-waste services. Last year, these programs together diverted over 6,000 tons of electronics for safe and proper recycling. New York City has a robust reuse sector comprised of nonprofit and commercial enterprises that collects and redistributes unwanted goods. Reuse is considered to be a higher and better use than recycling, as products can continue to be used for their original intended purpose. These efforts reflect a changing focus. How we export and dispose of waste has become an opportunity for us to build industries and develop a local economy around materials that can be recovered. Last year, we launched our Donate NYC web and mobile app to provide an easy way to find local opportunities to reuse unwanted goods. We also provide support to the local nonprofit community to expand their capabilities and reach more New Yorkers. Last year, the Donate NYC partners successfully diverted over 29,500 tons of used or surplus materials, not including textiles. In the next year, we will continue to grow Donate NYC to include food recovery and donation pursuant to Local Law 176, signed into law two weeks ago. DSNY has proudly served our partner agencies and city government for decades. Recently, we have redoubled efforts to engage these agencies not only in safe and effective waste management practices, but also as partners in our efforts to achieve our zero waste goals. More importantly, the New York City Housing Authority and the Department of Education, with more than 400,000 residents and 1 million students, respectively, are our two largest customers. And the success of our zero waste initiatives depends on their commitment and dedication. Over the past two years, the Department and the New York City Housing Authority have entered into an historic partnership to bring NYCHA developments into compliance with the city's recycling laws for the first time and to encourage res residents to recycle. As of December 2016, all NYCHA developments have consistent recycling infrastructure and have received an unprecedented amount of staff training and resident outreach. Over the next year, we will review voluntary incentive programs that may increase resident participation as required by Local Law 49 of 2017. Schools, which generate more than 40,000 tons of refuse per year, have been another point of focus in our zero waste efforts. New York City schools are educating our next generation of recyclers, and in 2016, we partnered with DOE to launch the first 100 zero waste schools with the ambitious goal of diverting all recyclable or compostable waste from those schools within five years. Through additional resources and the collaboration of teachers, principals, custodians, and cafeteria staff, it is our hope that schools will become models for others and will advance a culture of recycling and sustainability throughout the school system. So far, my testimony is focused on efforts by the department to give New Yorkers the access to programs to reuse or recycle waste. However, education, outreach, and enforcement are critical to participation in these programs and achieving our zero waste goals. Today, the department has a staff of 50 in our Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability that develops and operates programs, conducts training and outreach, and deploys communication and promotional tools from mailers to technical guides, to social media, and advertising. Just last year, we spent $4.5 million on communication and promotional tools, including mailers, flyers, advertisements, and reusable bag giveaways. However, marketing and promotion alone are not enough to achieve our ambitious goals. We have found, through decades of experience implementing recycling programs, that direct and personal conversations with everyday New Yorkers are the best way to achieve behavioral change. So we have implemented a diverse set of outreach programs, including partnerships through the New York City Compost Project, Grow NYC, NYC Service, and other organizations to reach as many New Yorkers as possible. In addition, we have specifically targeted outreach assets in low-income communities that have historically had the city's lowest recycling rates with the goal of doubling recycling diversion rates in the community districts with the lowest diversion rates. We have translated recycling education materials into the city's eight most commonly spoken languages, and we continue working with local community organizations to give all New Yorkers the tools they need 
to reduce waste and recycle more. So far, this strategy has led to demonstrable success. In the first two years, the targeted districts have increased their diversion rates by an average of 1.3 percentage points, a 14 percent increase since 2015. Today, we are incredibly proud of the work we have done so far to lay the groundwork for achieving our zero waste goals. However, we face a number of challenges on the road to achieving zero waste to landfills in the next 13 years. Surveys conducted by the department have shown that New Yorkers generally know what is recyclable and have a favorable view of it toward recycling. The overall diversion rate of New York City has increased from 14.8% to 20.5%. However, despite the multitude of convenient collection programs and the amount of marketing and outreach we conduct, we know that we can achieve much more with the current set of programs by continuing to change mindsets and behaviors. One of the greatest challenges to recycling in New York City, when compared to other American cities, is the incredible density and diversity of that building stock. Storage space, signage, and the level of custodial service are the most important factors for recycling compliance in our large, dense city. Our work with landlords and building managers has helped many to come into compliance with the city's recycling law in their buildings, and we applaud them for their efforts. But we still see fewer separated recyclables than we expect based on our waste characterization studies. To further change behavior among New Yorkers, we must continue to evaluate options available, including penalties like stricter enforcement and the expansion of mandatory participation programs, as well as additional marketing, education, and outreach tactics. The department anticipates spending more than $380 million next year to dispose of waste in out-of-city landfills and energy from waste facilities. While the amount of waste we create has decreased steadily over the past decade, the cost of disposing and transporting that waste has increased and space in landfills has decreased. However, New Yorkers are largely insulated from the growing cost of disposing of their waste as these costs are paid out of the city's general tax revenue. Monetary incentives for residents and property owners have been proven to lead to lower waste volumes and higher recycling rates, thereby reducing disposal costs and decreasing the environmental impacts of landfilling waste. In New York City, implementing a save-as-you-throw program that rewards those who waste less and recycle more could reduce waste generation by as much as 30 percent, representing the largest potential step toward achieving our zero waste goals. To evaluate this policy and develop a fair, equitable blueprint for waste reduction, the Department is currently finalizing a contract with a consultant to assess the range of options available to help New Yorkers save money as they reduce waste. However, any such program is likely to be controversial, and the Administration will depend on the support of the Council to implement a successful program. Zero waste is not simply an end-of-pipe concept. While the vast majority of the initiatives overseen by the Department focus on finding solutions for products that New Yorkers no longer want, we have also shifted focus upstream to influence the choices that manufacturers, retailers, and consumers make as they create, sell, and purchase products. However, the amount of influence we as a city, even the largest city in the country, have over these choices is strikingly small. We have joined in partnership with several consumer goods manufacturers, waste management enterprises, and other states and municipalities to work toward a circular economy where products and resources can be continuously reused, refurbished, and regenerated for ongoing use as new products. Some products simply do not belong in our waste stream. While the city has shown aggressive leadership in limiting or prohibiting certain products, including single-use carryout bags and food service foam products from use in New York City, we have time and again faced litigation and state preemption as threats to sound solid waste management policies. The Department will continue to evaluate policy options to identify and reduce the use of other non-recyclable and non-compostable products seek environmental stewardship, and explore options such as bans and fees to reduce the overall impact these products have on our local environment while encouraging New Yorkers to use more sustainable options. We rely on the partnership of the Council and our state legislatures 
to ensure that sensible policies that help lead towards zero waste can be put in place for the benefit of New Yorkers. While my testimony so far has not addressed the topic of commercial waste, I must acknowledge that this sector plays an important role in achieving our zero waste goals. Offices, stores, restaurants, and other commercial establishments generate an estimated 3 million tons of waste a year, only one-third of which is currently recycled. The Department is focused on implementing the City's recently revised commercial recycling regulations and expanding the commercial establishments required to separate commercial organics. In addition, we are pursuing the implementation of commercial waste zones in New York City. This policy represents a wholesale reform of the commercial waste industry and will significantly reduce truck traffic while simultaneously achieving our goals of reducing waste disposal, improving safety and working conditions, and establishing clear, consistent customer service standards. We look forward to working with the Council and a range of stakeholders in developing the implementation plan for this new strategy. Lastly, intro number 1573 under consideration today seeks to codify into law the administration's ambitious goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. As I have outlined today, the Department firmly supports this goal and our efforts to date demonstrate the measures we are taking to achieve it. Achieving this ambitious goal will require a combination of new policies and programs, legislative reforms, and partnerships with the private sector. And I look forward to working with the Council as well as our advocates in the state on legislative initiatives that are necessary to reach this goal. Together, we as New Yorkers have an incredible opportunity to achieve our goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. I firmly believe that all of the initiatives I've outlined today will place us on a clear path to achieving this goal. And I thank the administration and the council for their past, present, and future support as the department leads the city on this ambitious journey. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important subject today, and I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Costa Constantinides and Councilmember Brad Lander as well. Thank you for your testimony. Yes. And um, so. Right now, we're seeing the diversion rates around 20%, you have 20.5%. Mm -hmm. um, which initiatives will start pushing the diversion rates even higher? I know you, you talked about uh, save as you throw, and you've also talked about the waste, uh, the, um, I'm sorry. The circular economy? The yes. circular economy. Yes, um, sorry. Well, we have a lot more control over the programs that we roll out, and the biggest step change that we are currently rolling out is, is the organics program and getting participation in the organics program and getting the service across the city. Um, as I said in my testimony, 3.3 million people will have the service by the end of this year. Um, that is almost three times the size of any other city's program. Um, and by the end of next year, we should be fully rolled out with either curbside collection or with convenient drop-off service. But in terms of save as you throw, one of the things that happens is, well, the way that I think about it in terms of motivating people, there are certain people who are highly, highly motivated by uh, the environmental benefits of recycling. You know, there are certain people who are motivated by enforcement and by, and by penalties. And then there are certain people uh, who sometimes are motivated by what is the coolness factor. Uh, and we're trying to speak to all of those. But save as you throw is the idea is to give you an incentive for doing recycling the right way um, and really make it so that you benefit directly from actually participating. And it, in other cities has been, uh, so you've seen significant change when those have been rolled out. So we have um, 380 million next year to dispose of waste in and out the city. How much of your entire budget does that account for? Uh, the entire budget should be a little bit over 1.6 billion this year. So 380 is, I can't do the math in my head right this second, uh, but that's the proportion of it. The vast majority of my budget still is personnel costs. Yeah, the personnel costs. And outside of the personnel costs is how much it costs to take the trash to landfills. Right, and the 380 uh, is just once, once we have uh, gotten to our private vendors, how much it costs once that occurs. Okay, and just to put it in perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
about four years ago when we first started this committee and we asked about how, how much it would cost to send our waste to, to landfills, it was closer to like 280 million. So have we seen about a $100 million increase in four years in how much it costs to, to move the, the trash? It was closer to 300 million um, when I started. And yes, we are seeing extensive increases in uh, the costs uh, for disposal. So while we have bent the curve on the amount that we are producing, um, the cost per ton has been expanding, increasing, rising, going up. <laughs> that's, that's good. good. No, um, organics, I uh, just want to speak a little to um, what, what percentages are you seeing in the participation of the program for organics from folks? Um, because given that this is a, a large portion of our, of our waste stream, 31%, um, one, do, do we think we're doing a good job with the pilot program and where we're expanding it to? And should it go citywide? Do you feel that there might be a need to consider making it mandatory? So we've seen anywhere from participation rates from low in the 6% to in the mid-20s, uh, which is as anticipated based on our experience having rolled out other recycling programs over time. Um, so would I like to be moving faster? Uh, yes, I would, but it is a voluntary program. And so, you know, this is actually better than the mandatory metal, glass, and plastic program was when it first rolled out in the 80s. Um, so we are thinking that there should hopefully become at some point a path to mandatory, uh, considering we have not provided the service as broadly as we would like yet, it would probably be premature. So measuring, I think, I guess folks want to know where we are in our path to zero waste by 2030. Um, how are you measuring it and, and where can the general public see the progress that we're making to get to that goal? I think a lot of folks um, see what Vision Zero is doing and, and having a measurable goal and a target that we can hit um, and not necessarily having the same process or, or, or being able to see the progress we're making. Um, for zero waste, I just want to, what are you using to measure your progress? And can we ever get a hold of, of some type of system that allows us to see how, uh, the progress we're making in the city? I actually think you have access. Maybe my website is not as okay. easy to find. Yes. Um, but okay. there, there are really two, two ways that we're looking at it. One is, are we providing the access to the programs? Are we getting penetration across the city with all of the different programs that uh, we have provided to residents so that they can participate. Um, and then the second is basically always gonna be, at the end of the day, tonnage. And those metrics we put out by district every month um, of how much material uh, the city is producing. All right, so, so, we, so, so you have that somewhere on your website that it speaks to that. Does it speak specifically to zero waste or just general information about? about so it's, it's, it's not, we don't break it off as zero waste because the whole, whole idea of zero waste is that we're going to end up with very low tonnage numbers, so that's the numbers that are still there. Um, there's lots of information about the programs that make up uh, all of the zero waste initiatives. All right, so, and, and you believe that all your measurements are extremely accurate as to the progress we're making? On tonnage, they're absolutely accurate because I, you know, pay per pound. Um, so those numbers are absolutely crisp. Um, in terms of the access, the, the access numbers are also very accurate. They are based on census, so how many people have it is based on the last census numbers for those districts. But I think that they're, um, you know, I would, I would feel very secure that we are at, gonna be at 3.3 .3 million people, give or take uh, a few thousand by the end of this year. All right, and I think we should have maybe conversations offline as to what a me uh, the measurements look like and how they're able to be connected to the progress we're making on zero waste. Uh, because I think folks independently and in silos know the progress we're making on certain like organics and uh, metal glass and, and, and plastic and so forth. But as a goal, as a whole, it doesn't seem like it's, it's, to, it's together right now. And maybe that could be me, but the conversations I'm having with folks um, that really want to help the city achieve this goal don't really feel that there's one centered measurement or system that can really speak to the progress that we're making. And 
maybe it's not necessarily the measurement, but also um, just benchmarks. And, well, and well, all of our stuff is also managed by the mayor's office of sustainability and operations in terms of did we say we were going to, this is what we put out there, how far are we along? We do report annually in terms of the zero waste, uh, the one NYC report, which just came out back in April. But we're happy to sit down with anyone if they're feeling like they're not seeing what I'm seeing. I mean, I do live the details every day. Uh, but we're happy to have further conversations about what specifically they're looking for um, because we think we're being pretty transparent. But if we need to sort of put it together and package it differently, we're happy to look at that. We should because then we have uh, Councilmember Kalos's piece of legislation that speaks to um, benchmarks and making sure that we achieve them by law. Um, and I wasn't clear in your testimony on whether or not you actually supported the piece of legislation. What I, I saw there was that you support the intent and through your testimony have shown the progress that you've been making. But to set specific goals to reach um, the 90% diversion by 2030, um, is that something you support? I think there's something we should have uh, further conversations on exactly what that looks like in legislation and how that translates. Um, because we clearly are very committed to that goal and are working really, really hard. Um, but sometimes when things have been put into legislation, it hasn't actually translated into programs. Um, for example, there was legislation in the past administration uh, around what the recycling rates were to be. Uh, and I don't think that that has necessarily helped us get to where we are today. So. I guess it's part of the, 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 the whole just being able to see the progress we're making and mm -hmm. having those, how far along are we to 90%. Um, and, and people wanting to contribute to get there, see where the holes are. Um, again, I just don't think we have it maybe because, again, you're living it every day. You see it very clearly. Um, but for most folks on the outside looking in, um, there just doesn't seem to be uh, a narrative built around um, how we're getting there, how far along are we to getting there. Uh, in a way, again, and I want to be clear that Vision Zero seems to do that um, very clear, very clearly. Um, we just don't see that with, with zero by 30, zero by 30. So um, I guess we could have a conversation about yeah. what that looks like. Or maybe it's, a, it's an issue of putting the data in, in, in the right way. Uh, but we're very concerned. Uh, and, and then I want to speak to zero to 30 with commercial waste. Mm -hmm. A big part of this is the private industry and yes. the progress that they're going to make. Um, and here you have 33% of what you're getting from, uh, of the information that you're getting from commercial waste is recycled. Mm -hmm. um, so you have it at 33%. Our numbers are a little different, uh, a lot different. It's like 22%. That's a big, that's 11%. That's huge. All right. So they're, they're, there are a couple of things going on. Obviously, the big step change will be uh, commercial zone collection. That will be the big change. Um, but we are also have just begun doing uh, enforcement around the new commercial recycling uh, rules that went into place in August. Uh, we are doing enforcement against those who are required to source separate their organic material commercially. And in addition, one of the things that we've never really had a strong handle on because it was not regulated by the city was paper recyclers, uh, scrap metal recyclers. Uh, and so that whole industry was a little bit um, clouded for us. And so we have just gotten in the beginning of the second quarter of their reporting. And we think that, that those numbers will be really much more solid going forward. So um, we're getting a better handle on how material is moving through the city, uh, as well as taking steps to make sure that we are enforcing all of the rules that we have recently put in place. Um, but the big step change will be zone collection, because uh, it just will make the accountability about and the messaging for recycling clearer. All right, so I'm extremely concerned about the commercial waste and how exactly we're measuring the progress that they are making. Um, if you know, we feel that there's a lot of gray area in how the city might be uh, measuring or setting goals, 
Um, you can only imagine our concern over what the commercial waste industry um, is doing. Um, BIC is charged with collecting data on, on commercial recycling rates. Um, that they kind of have information as to where the garbage is going after it's picked up. Uh, and That's actually us. Excuse me? That's actually DSNY. You, oh, so you're talking DSN about the tonnage in and out of transfer stations? Uh, actually, we're going from where the garbage is picked up and where it's being sent. So if you okay, pick that's up, different. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. So, so we use that information to, you know, whether it's going to a MRF or it's going to a, a landfill, mm -hmm. it kind of helps us independently put together information to figure out if we're actually doing the recycling that we, we believe we're doing. That's why we have 20%, um, but you have 33 So obviously there's a discrepancy there um, where our, measure, our, our numbers don't line up. And I, I guess I want to speak to that, is that uh, what what systems are in place to ensure that we believe that the commercial recyclers are doing what they're supposed to or the, the commercial haulers are doing what they're supposed to. Um, what we're gonna see today after this is actually a video of recycled material just being thrown in the back of a truck, right? With black bags, yes. Huh? Yes, I've seen this. Exactly, so you've seen the videos, I'm glad. So, but in that, in that one instance, you might be charging a lot of that to recycling where, where we, we won't necessarily, well, so actually what, it'll all go to. What DSNY looks like is what goes over the scale at private commercial uh, transfer stations and what leaves. Um, so what tonnage is going to MRFs uh, and what tonnage is going to landfill. And so it's within that bucket. One of the reasons why I suspect that the numbers are different is we never had things where collections of paper went directly to the paper recycler uh, and that actually is a pretty significant volume of material. And so we're happy to sit down and go through it. We are working with and, and continue to try and figure out how to more effectively enforce both against the carters and the transfer stations regarding ensuring that they are in compliance with uh, the new commercial recycling rules. Um, we think they're very important. We want to make sure we're being effective. So can, can you speak to the, that enforcement? How many, I guess, haulers have been have been fined for mixing in uh, recycled material with general waste? It's rare that we catch the hauler. Um, we tend to find the businesses that we find when they're mixing materials. Um, we have done that uh, across the board. Uh, but we are looking at all of it as we have put this, these new regulations into place and holding transfer stations responsible as part of that. Right, so, so you see the concern of, uh, you know, business doesn't do their job, they get fined a waste hauler throws all the garbage that a good business is, is put together and separated, um, and they get to get away with it. Uh, and do you, you see where our concerns are um, regarding our ability to get a zero waste if we have like irresponsible haulers out there that can't be in, like, where it, it seems like we can't necessarily enforce appropriately? No, I, I mean, I think that we are, we are developing strategies to make sure that the enforcement is happening. I think that one of the worst things that ever happens in a recycling program is when people lose faith that what they are separating out is actually getting reused properly. Um, and I can let Bic speak to more of what they do in terms of enforcement, but we think that this is a growing area in which we will be doing, be more and more active going forward. Um, we do not intend to let them get away with it. Uh, so, you know, that is where our perspective is. All right, so uh, I, I have a lot, uh, many more questions, but I wanna open it up to uh, members of the council, of course. Uh, we're gonna go with uh, Council Member Ben Kalos first, followed by uh, Council Member Lander. So, Council Member Kalos. Uh, thank you for your support and the testimony. This is all new for me, so we'll uh, work together on this. Uh, so, how far along are we towards the goal of zero waste in 13 years? So, as you can see from the uh, testimony, we have about 3.2 million tons of waste that we still need to address. Um, we have over 640,000 tons of recyclables that we have effectively addressed. So those are the big numbers. Those are the ones that I'm looking at in terms of how are we driving that number down. And it's been relatively flat. It's always difficult going against a rising population figure, but we do feel that we are putting in place the, right now our metric is access to the programs, but the over met the, the metric in the long run is what are the number of tons that are still going to landfill and what are the number of tons that we have either diverted uh, to recycling or re diverted to reuse. 
And so zero waste is possible by 2030 and we are on track. So we are on track. I'm going to need some help, folks, though. There are going to be some big controversial projects that are going to come up in the future, maybe even a little more controversial than single-use plastic bags. Uh, with regards to uh, recycling, uh, I, I was a big fan, still am a big fan, of the multi-stream uh, bins that were put out. Uh, we have the Clean NYC initiative, and despite not being thrilled about the cost of the bins going up, uh, sanitation has had concerns about allowing council members to not only purchase uh, a, 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 uh, a waste bin, but also has not necessarily recommended purchasing additional streams. Uh, if you can go into that a little bit more, how we can improve recycling in public or uh, I know that the MTA takes their uh, garbage bins and then they sort them, or at least they say so on the sides of their cans. So I don't know where they do that, but okay. So, um, so I guess the question is, what can we do there in terms of so, uh, public collection efforts and uh, whether or not there's a commitment perhaps for park uh, for sanitation as you're doing it to match some of the 300 cans that we got on the east side with recycling as well? Um, so there are a couple things happening. One is we actually think we probably are going to pull many of the paper when we get back the waste characterization. People just are not carrying newspaper. Um, and so putting out a can that's specifically designed to capture the many newspapers in this city is really not going to probably make sense in the long term. Um, the second thing is we are very cautious about putting out recycle bins because they have been getting misused. Um, and they cause, they have been causing a lot of sort of overflowing trash bags, very, very, very highly contaminated. Um, and so while I actually think that New Yorkers know that the big blue one is actually for the metal glass and plastic, you know, sometimes they don't always do the right thing. And so we have to balance between wanting to continue to message the importance of recycling and the importance of recycling infrastructure with the fact that uh, it's as important to keep the city clean on a daily basis, which I know this council has been making enormous financial commitments towards. So um, we are continuing to try and figure out how to keep that balance. We have uh, thousands of public space recycling bins out there today, uh, but it is something in which we need to make sure that we are balancing that with the fact that um, we do not want to create a cleaning condition in your council district. Uh, you're not the first sanitation commissioner to bring up save as you throw. Uh, and I think uh, one question just being if, if perchance Council District 5 were to, to be courageous and be interested in piloting it uh, in our district and perhaps piloting it in District 8, District 6, uh, and I think five, five and, and, and uh, at and least 11. the the, that would normally be served by a marine transfer station. Is it possible that if we pi were to pilot save as you throw that we might not actually need the marine transfer station? Forgive me, you can't blame me for trying. Um, I always appreciate the fact that you are, you know, never let go of that. So um, let me put it this way. If we are not yet at what a uh, save as you throw program would look like, uh, so there isn't yet anything for your districts to pilot at this point in time. Um, I think that we'd be very open to working with you in terms of uh, what it might look like in, in your districts. Uh, there is still going to be material that comes out of your district. So at this point in time, we still need the 91st Street Marine Transfer Station. OK. And then just back to the uh, legislation, uh, I think it's it's pretty bare bones we're interested in exploring. Would you be open to adding a, a progress report, whether it's just what you already have on the site or what you put in the MMR, which if you haven't read it, it just came out. It's absolutely riveting uh, in terms of your zero waste report. I thought it was riveting. I was very pleased with it. Um, I think that there's, there actually, I think all the pieces are in a combination of places. They're in, they're in what the mayor reports on in the one NYC, uh, on their dashboards with the mayor's office of sustainability, and they're in the MMR. I mean, there's some way we can recast something so that it's, you see it almost more branded. 
uh, we can talk about that. I, for one, uh, I, I went and looked at the reports and I found them scintillating, but there's absolutely a way to present them in a way that's more user friendly. Would love to see how far you can break it down if you can break it down by community boards or even council districts because I know that my district can get closer to zero waste than Antonio Reynoso's district and Brad Lander's district. Oh, do you don't want to take on Brad? You don't uh, want to take on Brad. I, I, I'm just Brad has, that, Brad has that, my, my, my best performing district followed not by upper the Upper East Side, but by Manhattan one, they're number two. Where, so, where, where, where's Manhattan eight in that? Uh, I can actually tell you where Manhattan 8 is because I actually have your ranking. Uh, you Oops. are number four. I, 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 I was in the top five when you City and in State the top did, five. did some uh, analysis, so it, it, it's okay to be in the top five with Brad. And just where's, where's the chair of sanitation on this list? Where's uh. his, which community district are you? He's, he crosses. He's hard. Huh? Brooklyn, Brooklyn won. See Brooklyn. Oh, here I can just do this one. Uh, you're down the list a bit. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we'll work on it. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that um, one calling the MMR riveting. I think it's the first time I've heard that uh, ever. So I'm the GovOps uh, chair. I know. I know you are. We're, we're both data geeks, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to reading it today as well. Um, and. Uh, again, with pilot programs, I don't, uh, save as you throw, I'm glad you want to take that on. Um, it's not as popular in my district, but I'm excited to, to help out. Uh, I just want to talk about the, the zoning, the ways zoning district. So a, a big problem that we have is we all want to do this great recycling. We want to have these diversion rates that are impressive, um, but not at the expense of, one, um, worker safety, uh, mm -hmm. and two, the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, when it came to the organics pilot expansion, um, I was very excited about organics recycling in general, uh, but then found out that a lot of the organics uh, recycling is gonna happen within my district or the truck, the, the, the waste transfer stations would be taking it on. A lot of contracts in community board one. Uh, you all, we, I've said it many times, the third highest rates of asthma in the city of New York um, and 40% of the city's trash being handled in our district uh, the truck traffic is a huge issue. Um, are, can we speak to equity and what we're going to be doing to make sure that we do all this in, in a way that has less of an environmental impact in these, um, in these environmental justice districts? And also, uh, worker safety has become something that's, uh, that the industry just started to look at since I think last year or a couple of years. They're, they're really focused on it now because we had a study that, without a study, nothing happens, but we had a study that showed that it was a very dangerous job, probably the most dangerous job here in the city of New York. We just want to know what, what parts of this whole plan speak to those two issues. So, I mean, I think that uh, both you and I are completely on the same page about worker safety. Nationally, uh, workers involved in the refuse and recycling industry have some of the highest rates of injury. Um, that's true within the department. That's also true within the private sector. Uh, we have been working very hard in partnership often with many of the private sector carters to make sure that we are doing symposiums about safety, exchanging best practices, uh, talking about training. But this will be a key component when we do the zoning. Um, the metrics on what worker safety looks like will be something that will be definitely incorporated. Uh, secondly, in terms of thinking about the organics infrastructure, um, you are correct that it does end up having to go to a transfer station at this point in time, um, unless it's on Staten Island, it goes to a compost facility directly. Uh, but we've been trying to expand our compost facilities um, and some of our local, our smaller uh, um, community partners facilities, and we made investments in Brad's district at the Gowanus uh, compost facility. Um, we are making investments in our Staten Island facility, um, but there will be uh, material that is likely to go through transfer stations. There is actually only one transfer station, I believe, that we are actively using in North Brooklyn, 
um, for organic material, which is uh, waste management. There is no material at this time going through city organics or whatever they're calling themselves right now, um, Brooklyn Transfer. Uh, and they actually have no more refuse, DSNY refuse trucks going through Brooklyn Transfer. Um, as, of, as of when? As of when I opened up Hamilton. Okay, thank you for that. Two weeks ago. That's, that's progress. Um, a lot of the folks don't know the details. A little but inside baseball we're making here some for, progress. for folks who, um, but you know, we are looking to have infrastructure in all of the boroughs to manage organic material. And so um, that is our goal. Uh, so I know we're diving in a little bit too early, but given the need for safety improvements, you know, better trucks in general, uh, and just the overall improvement of the commercial sector of, of waste management, not the company, just the management of waste, um, uh, are, are you concerned over the complexities and the increasing, uh, the increase of, of, of the cost of handling commercial waste in the city of New York through a franchising or a zone program? I guess I'm asking is, it, it will it cost more because cost we're asking everybody. more of people? So, I mean, I, I think that we're not quite there yet. We are engaged right at the moment with all the stakeholders from all of our research. Uh, one of the things we found is that small business owners tended to pay significantly more per ton than large business owners in the city of New York. Um, and that new zone collection did not necessarily in other cities cause costs to rise. Um, so we think that it's not, depending on how the design goes, uh, will probably likely drive what the cost question is, but this is something we will be engaging with the council on extensively, um, because with whatever we end up developing jointly together, I'm pretty sure we're gonna need legislation. Um, so, you know, that's really, we want to make sure that we are balancing all of these different requirements. Yeah, I just, uh, I want to pass it on to Brad after. Just my concern is that we've, we've tried to pass pieces of legislation that I think are significant and would had a positive impact on the work that we're doing here in the city of New York um, and it being shut down, that these other initiatives that we want to take on that can significantly improve our diversion rates. Uh, I'm just concerned that that's, that, is, that is the foundation by which we intend to get to zero to 30, um, relying on us in the city council to pass these measures. And then after, even if we do get that to happen, um, not, being, not, being, uh, 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 not allowing for the state to be consumed over nonsense, I think. Uh, I'm very concerned about that. So that zero to 30 is possible, but we need a uh, all in from the city council. So we should start advocating and lobbying now um, for that to make sure we can have, it can happen. I wanna call on Council Member Brad Lander. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. It's, it's, um, it is, I'm glad we're here today. And I, you know, of course I am proud to represent the community that you know, is the best at uh, recycling and diversion. And we're glad to have the new composting facility in Gowanus. And though it's just across the line in Carlos's district, uh, the new Gowanus MTS is you know, just about visible from my, from my house. And we, we're trying to do our fair share. Um, and obviously we're working together on so many things. At the same time, like we're not, I just guess, uh, we're not on path to zero waste by 2030. And I do think we should be honest about it together. It's the right goal. These are the right policies. Um, but it's, it's slow going and building the level of support we need, both for the policies we need and for the behavior that we need. Um, we're, we're not, I just I don't want to be complacent about it. Like we're not on a glide path to it. We need some pretty significant changes that people in this room have been pushing for, but we don't have enough uh, partners uh, in, in either in New York City or in Albany. So I, um, uh, I guess since, we, since you've teed up the two uh, areas where, and you mentioned them in your, in your testimony, Commissioner, just on, on foam and on single-use plastic bags, let's just get a quick update. I mean, on foam, at least I, I hope we're headed toward uh, implementation under your report. I assume we'll have we're to being be back in court, but your report is so good that I am optimistic that the judge is going to read it and be persuaded. But why don't you just give us a brief update on where we are? I don't think opposing counsel th found it very persuasive. Um, 
So they have filed. <coughs> uh, the same coalition has filed again. Uh, we are in front of the same judge again. Uh, and so our papers are due, I believe, uh, mid-October to late October. Uh, I am cautiously optimistic that we're in a good place there. Um, but I was wrong last time. And so uh, I'm hoping not to be wrong this time. I think it is a stronger determination than we did the first time. Uh, and hopefully we get where we need to be on that. I, I was up actually in uh, very, very upper Manhattan, you know, at an ungodly hour, like 5.30 in the morning. Uh, and there's styrofoam everywhere. Like literally all over the street, like something had happened on the overnight uh, to which, you know, I got to the garage and I was like, okay, you all are gonna have to go clean that up. But it was breaking up all over the, the street at the time. So, you know, I wish that it was a material that was recyclable, that would make my life a lot easier, uh, but it's not. And so we just have to be honest about that. Yeah. No, no, and I mean, I would urge anyone who wasn't at that hearing to go back and, and watch at the hearing. I mean, first, read the character, you know, the, the commissioner's report. It is quite clear, and I have my fingers crossed that the judge will read it honestly and see it that way, because the case is open and closed. If you watched our hearing, you would uh, feel the same way. So I'm going to cross my fingers that this, uh, you know, that the case is dismissed and that you're able to move forward under the prior law from last term. But I guess just, uh, you know, Mr. Chair, you and I need to be on notice and, and put our colleagues on notice that if it doesn't go that way, um, it's on us. So, like, let's just, that's number one. Uh, on plastic bags, I guess I think you've probably heard the same that I have, which is that meeting number two of the governor's statewide task force is taking place next month. So we're a lot of months in, and this will be the second meeting. But I'm also going to cross my fingers there, because nothing would make me happier than the governor's task force reporting out a good statewide policy. California's got a dynamite statewide policy uh, that's dramatically reducing the use of single-use plastic bags and reducing paper bag use as well. And I know you would, you and I would be the first ones to praise uh, the, the state as soon as that's in place. Um, you, have, you heard, you have, have you heard any more than, than I, that? I have no more gossip than you do, but I have to say that the, uh, the, the text of the press release that created the task force gives me optimism that they really are on the hook to come up with something that maybe ends up being far broader than what the city was thinking of doing. Here, here, look, a statewide policy is, is what, you know, I think what it's happened better. in California was yeah. that cities did a range of experimentation and then they got to a very strong and highly impactful statewide policy. So I would, I would love never to have to bring legislation back to this body again because the state puts a good policy in place um, at the same time uh, if they don't, that's another place, Mr. Chair, where you and I may have to be uh, on notice for the future. Um, I want to talk a little more about um, Save As You Throw on both the residential and the commercial sides. Um, I'll just start by sort of joining in, you know, with Councilmember uh, Kalos and saying that, you know, when it comes to uh, needing to look at a pilot program, you know, uh, that, that our district would, would be open to talking about it. The question for me, and I guess I just want to ask about the study and how we're thinking about it, is what are the incentives that get people to move forward? So I know one alternative idea is adjusting collection schedules, mm -hmm. you know, so that if you did once a week refuse pickup and twice a week organics and recycling pickup, you know, how far does that get us? And so, uh, you know, there's, a, there's some certainly behavioral economics about this. The goal here is, you know, is to try to find the things we can best possibly do to alter people's behavior. It is not difficult to, you know, obviously if everyone just recycled their recyclables and put their organics in the compost bin, we would be at radically higher rates than we are. And I, you know, so I'm, I'm, I guess I want to hear a little more about the study that we're looking at and how we're thinking, not just like what would it cost, but what are the, what are the, how are we thinking about the policies that would actually do the most to drive behavior change in ways that significantly reduce? Right, no, certainly, let, let me talk a little bit to that. We're not that as far along as we are on the uh, commercial zoned collection. Uh, we don't have the consultant yet in place who's been working on this, but certainly we think you, you are the only community board I think that has ever come and asked for less collection which you received. Um, 
Yes, they were a three-day-a-week refuse and went to a two. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely opportunities, but we have to look at that in the context of uh, how long does that mean your route one day a week is for sanitation workers, and have we now made that unachievable? Um, and how, you know, there's some other things that we're focused on, but in terms of looking at whether or not reduction in frequency is an option, we certainly want to think about that being on the table as part of it, so it's not necessarily just a financial, but also around, a, you know, what's the most convenient. Uh, clearly, that's what some other cities have done, actually in parallel with uh, uh, Save As You Throw programs. Um, and then on the commercial side, you know, I'm a, a wholehearted supporter of, of the zone system. I'm glad that we're moving forward to it. Um, but I guess I do want to make sure to connect the dots, and maybe you did and I missed it, but between that and the commercial save-as-you-throw equivalent, because obviously we want the businesses themselves to have strong incentives to reduce their waste, to be participating in uh, commercial organics, to be doing their recycling. So I, I hope we're looking at a system where the incentives on businesses passed through their new zone collection system will in the same way that some kind of save as you throw type system. It seems like a business is an even better place to put that in place. They got a budget, they know their bottom line, if they can save money by, and, you know, and then they really can look upstream in a different way so that if they can think about, you know, what changes they can make that make their customers less likely to throw out cups or, you know, whatever it would be all the way down through participating. So what, how are we thinking about that? So, so because context? it's, it's because the private sector has always paid for their waste, um, in some ways they have had an incentive to recycle, particularly paper. It's just been very opaque. So oftentimes uh, what will happen is the carter would charge you a different amount as long as he's getting the paper too. Um, but, you know, it's not clear. Like, one of the things that zone collection will be able to do is make it very clear and make it very clear what the charges are for refuse versus recycling um, and allow it to be something that we can differentiate on. Um, and in, in terms of looking upstream, particularly one of the things we did this summer was the food waste fair to talk to businesses, particularly restaurants, about the amount of food that gets wasted. And there are very clear, uh, some real research about, like, here's how your buying pattern is shaping up. Here's how, like, you know, you're thinking, you know, if you're thinking about inventory management, think about it a little bit of a different way and try and bring experts to them because wasting less can also save them money. Very, very, particularly in that industry, really very directly. Um, all right, and then when you talk about the difference between for businesses refuse and recycling and that being very clear and being posted, I, this is just where I need some more help. I, obviously, I understand that if your carter, uh, you know, is, is paying the tipping fee and, and not paying because, in fact, they're getting some modest amount for the recyclable commodities, there's a difference there. But how do I know that? How does that get passed back to me? as a business and how do I know it and what can we, and I, I, you know, again, you're just educating me here. I don't know whether that's different in our current system than where it's going to, I hope that so the franchise system can do more to help all of us help businesses save money by doing the kinds of things we're talking about. So there are a couple things. If you're a big business, you're pretty sophisticated. You know where the paper rates are. You know where those commodity markets are. We're getting about $35 a ton right now. Um, I'm going to tell you if you're a producer of a lot of paper, in your waste stream, you know that you're having conversations with your carter right now today because those, those dollar figures are up higher than they've been in a long time. Um, if you're a small business, you have no clue. Uh, and so that is really what we're trying to make it is to make sure that all businesses have the ability to look at this across and see what the actual costs are and whether or not we can make sure that they are incentivizing the right behaviors in those broader contracts we anticipate putting together within this program. Okay, and then Mr. Chair, I don't know whether you're gonna talk to the, do the BIC separately. So we, we are, um, I think it's the monitoring and enforcement um, is a big part of it. So we will have 
conversations with Big, but Big is not going to speak today. So it would have to be something we do offline. Um, today, only DSMI is. Okay. And, That's I mean, obviously, we're only six weeks into the new system, but it would be great when, you know, when we're ready to get, a, you know, some information on how that's going, both how it's going so far for the issues you and I care about and also what it's starting to teach us that we need to learn for zone collection. Yeah, no, certainly. We can also provide you an interim of, like, you know, what we've been doing on inspections, what violations we've written. You know, we keep track of all of that and all of the numbers going through the transfer stations on what we see quarter by quarter in terms of refuse, MGP, paper, and then what we're finding from the new uh, folks who are required to report to us. All right, and then just my last question is just on um, multifamily building composting. You know, that is one of the more challenging areas of the organics program. It's just a lot easier in a one or a two family home, and I know one challenge for all of us is getting it taken up into the multifamily stock, and I wonder what you can tell us about how that's how that's going and what else we can do to move it forward. You know, we continue to have interest in it. You can enroll your apartment building today if you are in an organics district, if you're in Manhattan, if you're in the Bronx. Um, and we have some very large complexes that have enrolled, such as uh, Stytown Peter Cooper Village. And they've been very happy with the program. Um, I think we're getting four or five tons a week from them of organic material. So uh, it's, it's significant, and we know that we want it, but we, we also want to make sure that we're working with buildings individually uh, because instead of when we just work with residences, the only, we work with the owner, and the owner sort of does it or doesn't do it, but here we could have a renter who does the right thing, but then if your porter or super doesn't, then it's not going to work, and then everyone gets discouraged. So we want to make sure that we're hitting all of those pieces moving forward. Super. And I haven't checked on your on your website or your social media recently, but it might be useful, I know, as I'm talking to multifamily building, both residents and owners, to have some cases like that to point to, make a little video about how well it's going in Stye Town, or something that just lets us say, um, look at this, they're doing it, it's working, we, 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 can, we can send you the link to the YouTube video. Outstanding. All right, I look forward to that. Uh, thanks very much. Let's keep pushing. Thank you, Councilmember. Lander, we also have uh, been joined by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson from the Bronx. Um, so engagement, uh, I think, is extremely important, um, of course, and educating the public on how to do all this work eventually to get us to zero waste. Um, so there is a, a couple of things. Mayor's Zero Waste Steering Committee, um, I don't know anything about it. Just would like to know what is it that they do, how often do they meet, and what, do, and what reports do they have um, or minutes that we can get to, to the progress that they're making, I guess. All right, I think this is really coming out of the One NYC program. Um, and so, you know, we've had conversations with them and also a lot of linkages because of the 80 by 50 crossover. Um, but, you know, that has not been the driver. Of, they've been extremely helpful about doing, um, for example, the waste challenge that we did a year, two years ago now, um, where we challenge businesses to really reduce their waste. Uh, but we don't think of that as the driver. So we're doing a lot on social media, um, literally person-to-person -person interactions around all of these programs. We've been doing in neighborhoods uh, that have the organics program going back and doing, uh, if we don't see your brown bin out, you get a little frowny banana postcard, uh, which tends to actually generate usually participation the next time we go out and look. But if you're participating, then you get a smiley one with a, a zero by 30 reusable bag, uh, making sure that we're in the local papers, whether or not that's the Brooklyn Eagle or the Staten Island Advance. Or, we think that those are very important for the way that our outreach is done. And while, of course, we always do the big articles, like the New York Times or the Daily News, sort of folks in their neighborhood want to feel like they're connected to other folks in their neighborhood and that it's becoming the new norm there. Uh, so we're pushing on a lot of fronts, and you know we intend to keep doing that and welcome any commentary about how our reach is uh, and whether or not we're getting into certain communities. So we're going to actually do something um, primarily in your uh, 
in your district around the high holidays uh, and around creating, here's a compostable package for, you know, how to have the compostable holiday. Um, and you see if that generates interest. So in, I guess when I see, when I hear about a steering committee, uh, the conversations I have are with the Manhattan and Brooklyn swab and advocates uh, across the board. I want to be involved in the solution in getting to zero by 30 um, and, and maybe not being as, as involved or participating the way they would like to. So um, I guess what opportunities are there for organizations on the outside that want to be a partner with the DSNY to help achieve this goal? And if there isn't something that's, uh, that's uh, something they can touch or something that they can feel that is actually, con that where they're actually contrib contributing, is the steering committee an opportunity maybe to make it a, a more, uh, I, I don't want to say serious, but make it something that we can get outside stakeholders involved in uh, helping us achieve our, our goals? So, I mean, I, I don't think it's appropriate for that particular one. So that's really an interagency push. Um, but I do think that there's always opportunities, like, you know, we are actively involved in both the Brooklyn and Manhattan swab. People often speak to those particular uh, groups. Um, we would like them to be even more use helpful in terms of getting the message out. What more can they do? Where can they leverage uh, any contacts that they have? Um, so, you know, we're not you know, we, we spend a lot of time with a bunch of different organizations and groups, whether or not it's our, uh, the compost project where we meet very often with all of those uh, particular community gardeners or Big Reuse or Gowanus. Um, we think that that's extremely important, that they have been sort of the stormtroopers for trying and experimenting with new things. So um, we're very welcoming to people who want to work with us and want to uh, be part of the process uh, and move forward. So, you know, we're always happy to talk to you. So I'm going to actually see if uh, we can work with some stakeholders, the city council, um, following this hearing, see how we think we might be able to be helpful in helping you achieve your goal. We want to be partners. And while, you know, many, some of us are not as optimistic as others regarding on whether or not we can get there uh, by 2030, uh, I think we all agree we all want to be partners in trying to get as close to that as possible. And, and it is, uh, there is no way I'm doing this by myself. Uh, I am not getting there all by myself. I need the council to be supportive. I need the advocates to help us get legislation passed to get communities on board with what we're doing. So this is not something where the administration wants to go it alone. Uh, we really do welcome your support and participation. So I just want, I want to, again, encourage these measurable goals would be helpful to us in, in, in sounding the alarm as to where we are and where we should be and possibly getting more people involved on the outside looking in again. But if there's nothing that we can present to the general public about how far we've gone or how far we need to go, um, it makes it seem like you you are taking this on uh, taking this task on on your own. You're not allowing us to be a part of the solution by holding it close to your chest as to whether or not we can actually get there. So, so I actually have a question for you. Um, so, you know, one of the things we've sort of been playing with, and I haven't figured out whether or not I think it makes things better or makes things worse, is making uh, it be more transparent to residents where their community is in the ranking. Like, does it help someone in your community let you know that, yeah, y'all are doing about half what Brad's community is doing? Um, and it's yeah. like, you know, there are some places that'll tell me the research suggests that that actually motivates people uh, because they're highly competitive. I'm just not sure if people find it insulting. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's one of the things that, like, you know, I would actually love to have folks who are the elected representatives give me some feedback on, uh, because I don't actually know what I, what I think about that yet. Go ahead, Brian. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, mean, I think one thing that is an interesting challenge here and an opportunity also, like people in your district have a real vested interest in reducing waste because they know it moves through their neighborhood and that helps overcome the sense that, Oh, you know, recycling is some crunchy elite park slope 
thing and you know what what things we can do together I don't know that I think where we are at the moment I mean there's no harm in publishing the rankings but I don't think intra neighborhood competition at the moment where we are is what's going to motivate people this kind of goes to that I guess what I was sort of saying before like I hope that your consultant will not only be somebody who you know, can sort of do the math on tonnage and knows things about uh, waste handling, but is looking at some cutting edge stuff in beh the behavioral side of economics. What are the things that across all the demographic differences we have in New York City can do best as possible to motivate people to join in making these changes? Yeah, and I, and I agree with Councilmember Brad Lander, I don't, I don't think, uh, well, I believe that we have certain, certain socioeconomic issues that differ by community and certain circumstances that differ by community that make it so that some folks have, um, do a better job at achieving their diversion rates than others. So while I hear what you're saying and trying to just figure out a way to motivate people, um, it, w it should be part of the conversation because I think on an ind individual basis, if I'm able to show my community um, how far away they are from, let's say, the citywide average and so forth, I think it could be helpful if I do that individually. But if we're just setting, you know, I, I know what it's going to look like if you give me the whole list. I think I could, I could, I could tell you what it's going to look like th uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, give or take. Um, and I don't think we need that just yet. I think we could, be, uh, we could figure out a plan together that gets us to motivating folks um, and not necessarily, I think, I think we get the point. Uh, yeah, so I know it's hard. It's very difficult for you, but individually, please give it to me because I have uh, members of the community here and organizations from the community here, um, like Outrage, um, that care deeply about uh, getting trucks off the street and showing them those numbers might motivate them to start working more internally. Like, let's handle our business here and see where we can go from there. So absolutely, I think there's a conversation to be had. But um, thank you for that. Comment. I just have a couple more questions because then I want to allow for other folks to come in and, and testify as well. Um, I know you work with NYCHA and the Department of Education, uh, but are you working with any other uh, um, agencies like DEP and so forth um, that can help us, that are helping us achieve this goal as well? Um, so those are the biggest programs are NYCHA and, uh, and DOE because obviously those are the most retail for us. Um, we have, all agencies are requ required to have recycling plans in place. Um, and then in terms of DEP, obviously they're a partner on the compost side because they are taking um, food slurry into the Newtown Creek digesters. And what about the MTA, the great MTA, and the work that they're doing? Um, we're thrilled that they're putting out an anti-litter message. Uh, whether or not it's just for helping with track fires for them, as long as people are hearing, please stop uh, throwing things on the ground, it's important. Uh, we don't directly manage their waste material, uh, so that has been less of a coordinated effort, but um, you know, we are always looking for partners to continue to make sure that we're pushing forward on the overall goal of, of reducing waste. Um, well, those are, those are the questions that I have for now. Um, I know we're going to have some great testimony coming up in a, in a couple of panels. I hope that we can have DSNY stay here as long as possible. But we have um, panels in support. Uh, well, all panels are in support of zero by 30, I guarantee you that. Uh, but how we get there, I think, is where we differ. So um, we'd love for you to stay as long as possible. But thank you for your testimony, of for course. sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I'd like to call up our next panel. Um, Annabelle Short, Justin Wood, Melissa Icahn, Justin Wood, and Eric Goldstein.
So hello, panel. Um, I was just talking to my counsel here. It's just, it's so much work that needs to be done. Uh, we we're trying to go through it one at a time, and it's just within each subject matter, we could go on for days. Um, and again, I hope that we can continue to figure out a way to work together to attempt to achieve this. Um, but uh, now, I don't know in which order we're going to speak, but I, I'm guessing you guys have that figured out. All right. All right. All right. Go on. No. Is it now? No, it is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So my name is Annabelle Short of Align, the Alliance for a Greater New York. Thank you, Committee Chair Reynoso and members of the Sanitation Committee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Transform Don't Trash Coalition. TDT campaigns for economic, racial, and environmental justice in the private waste industry in New York City. The core members of the coalition are Align, NYC Environmental Justice Alliance, Teamsters, Joint Council 16, NILP, and NRDC, many of whom you're going to hear from um, during this hearing. The current commercial waste system in New York City is broken, as you've been hearing, and is impeding progress towards the city's ambitious goal of zero waste to landfill by 2030. As many of you know, we currently have a system in which approximately 90 companies licensed by the Business Integrity Commission collect waste from stores, restaurants, and other businesses throughout the city, running inefficient overlapping routes. This means that on any given night, you can see six or seven different trucks collecting garbage from the same block, then crisscrossing over to the other side of the city to dump the garbage at waste transfer, sta transfer stations, generating far more traffic and emissions than is necessary. At the same time, oversight, accountability, and transparency are sorely lacking. The inefficient system combined with a lack of oversight leads to many problems. For example, based on industry self-reported figures likely to be higher than the reality, the commercial recycling rate's only 22%, compared to a national average of around 35%, and far higher figures in some cities. Haulers have failed to adhere to the city's long-standing and new recycling rules. And as you'll hear today from our coalition partners, many continue to refuse to recycle source-separated materials with absolutely no repercussions. So in this environment, the city's zero waste goals are doomed to fail. The system has also contributed to severely reduced air quality and increased asthma rates in low-income communities of color. It has created a race to the bottom, resulting in low wages and dangerous work environments for workers, as well as fluctuating and non-transparent rates for customers, particularly small businesses that have far less bargaining power than large ones. Luckily, as we've heard, <laughs> the mayor and Commissioner Garcia have already committed to making important changes. Our coalition continues to applaud Mayor de Blasio's commitment made in August 2016 to introduce the commercial waste zoning system. Done right, this has the potential to dramatically increase the diversion of waste to landfills, create thousands of good jobs, reduce the burden on communities, reduce emissions, improve working conditions, and make our streets safer. In other cities, we've seen how commercial zoning can transform waste collection for the better. Los Angeles recently rolled out its groundbreaking Recycle LA program, and London has now introduced the idea. Doing this well will be one of the powerful ways that New York City can demonstrate its leadership within the context of the devastating rollbacks in environmental protections that we're seeing from the federal government. The long-term nature of the contracts under the zoning system will incentivize investments in infrastructure that are essential to significantly drive up recycling rates and make faster progress towards zero waste. Transform Don't Trash has projected that by increasing its total diversion rate, i.e. commercial and residential, to 70%, NYC could rapidly create 3,300 new local jobs in processing recyclables and organic waste, in addition to the temporary construction jobs needed to build and upgrade recycling infrastructure. These thousands of new jobs could, in turn, increase opportunities for women and minor minority-owned business enterprises. <coughs> From these brief remarks, I hope it's clear that our city's zero waste goals cannot be achieved under the status quo. We have a major opportunity ahead of us to transform this industry for the benefit of all New Yorkers. The TDT Coalition looks forward to working productively with the Sanitation Committee, other council members, and the administration to turn this opportunity into a reality. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop. No. I'll okay. Nopey. 
<laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Yashan, and I'm a senior staff attorney in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. I'm here today with my colleague, Justin Wood, the Director of Organizing and Strategic Research at NILPI. NILPI is a core member of the Transform Don't Trash NYC Coalition. Thank you to Chair Reynoso and the Sanitation Committee, which sort of was here at some point, for holding another timely oversight hearing on the critical issue of waste reduction in our city. As the city has acknowledged, there is simply no way we can meet our greenhouse gas reduction targets without dramatically reducing the amount of waste we send to landfills and incinerators. I want to begin on a positive note by thanking DSNY Commissioner Garcia and her staff and the City Council for all of the positive changes we are seeing in our city's approach to waste management. The adoption of ambitious zero waste goals for both the residential and commercial waste streams the return of MGP recycling on the residential side and the expansion of organic waste recycling on the residential side should be recognized as critical first steps that must now be aggressively multiplied to approach zero waste by 2030. We also want to applaud the innovative moves DSNY and the mayor are making to reform the commercial pretressable waste sector, which produces as much or more waste than the residential sector, but has historically operated with far less city oversight, monitoring, and accountability. Specifically, we wanted to highlight two great initiatives. First, the mayor and DSNY's plan to implement a zoned commercial waste collection system has enormous potential to increase diversion if the new system is set up to properly incentivize business owners and private waste haulers to recycle far more waste and to invest in the processing capacity our city needs to approach zero waste being sent to landfills. Second, the city's adoption of new commercial recycling rules and the possible expansion of mandatory food waste recycling rules are a step in the right direction. Given the huge amount of waste generated by our commercial sector, a third of which is estimated to be organic food waste, recycling and composting cannot be treated as optional, voluntary activities if we are to move the needle on diversion at all, let alone get to zero waste. However, the adoption of new rules will not be enough to reform a commercial waste system that remains fundamentally built around trucking massive amounts of waste through land-based transfer stations who do very little recycling by haulers who have very little experience or desire to expand recycling and composting services. I now want to draw the Council's attention to troubling evidence that even in the wake of the positive developments by the City, the private waste industry, including many companies that take great pains to portray themselves as green, are simply continuing to ignore the City's recycling rules. The following video is an example of what happens to recyclables and source-separated compost at a business that does appear to be doing the right thing, carefully putting their food waste in compostable bags and separating their dry recyclables and cardboard from refuse. And after the video, my colleague Justin Wood will continue our testimony. Oops, oops. And the cardboard. <laughs> there goes that high value cardboard. <laughs> okay, I think we get the picture. Um, so, uh, thank you, Chair Reynoso, and to the uh, Sanitation Committee. My name is Justin Wood, and I'm also at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Um, unfortunately, this kind of video that an ally of our coalition uh, took just one week ago, here we are six weeks into, and really 20 years into, right? Commercial recycling rules aren't new. They've been on the books since the 90s when Commissioner Sexton, who's here, and others fought for them. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't an isolated incident. 
Um, on any given night, we've been able to observe similar behavior where commercial haulers are throwing recyclables. Often they're in clear bags or, or clearly, you know, cardboard bundles uh, are still being commingled in the same trucks as black bagged putressible waste. Um, so in addition to the video, I mean, here's a couple pictures. Clear uh, MGP and cardboard recyclables that were thrown in the same truck. I think this is in your district, Chair Reynoso. I think this was in North Brooklyn, taken in 2017. Uh, and here's the same thing in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Clear MGP and recyclable containers, even some cardboard in the same truck um, as putressible. And those are two of the largest BIC licensees in the city. Um, I don't think I need to name them today because this is an industry-wide problem in New York City, but um, suffice it to th say that they're two of BIC's largest uh, licensees and that they both own substantial transfer station infrastructure in addition to substantial hauling fleets. Um, while the private waste industry is clearly the problem here, we're also seeing a disparity in enforcement between the generator side, where DSNY is handling enforcement, and the carters themselves, which are regulated by the Business Integrity Commission, which we did not hear from today. Uh, in 2016, we saw that DSNY launched a major education and enforcement campaign uh, to educate business owners and employees on how to properly separate recyclables and organics. And as of August 1st, sanitation police were to begin issuing violations to businesses that violate these rules. It's crystal clear in these rules that recyclable paper, cardboard, glass, metal, and plastic are not to be commingled with putrescible and non-recyclable waste, as we've seen in these examples. According to the publicly in, uh, available information in the office, uh, the OATH, commonly called the OATH database, over 290 violations uh, issued by sanitation are in that database uh, since August 1st. In contrast, as of last week, the Business Integrity Commission, which regulates the commercial waste industry, had not issued a single recycling violation uh, in the same database. Similarly, we have a lack of data and monitoring in the commercial waste system to determine how much waste is actually recycled uh, by the more than 90 private companies actively collecting and processing this waste stream. For now, all we have to go on, uh, and we may have heard from DSNY today, I'll, I'll veer off my written testimony here, that there are some improvements in that data collection, but really what we have to go on is self-reported summaries of tonnages sent to landfills, incinerators, and recyclers by private transfer stations and MRFs in, in, this, in and near the city. Um, the reports we've seen, and these are again publicly available through the state DEC, uh, are often unclear, incomplete, and sometimes contain basic arithmetic errors. So it's hard to piece together what exactly is happening in that commercial waste industry. So you heard a couple different estimates. These are still estimates. Um, the disappointing estimate of 22% that we came up with was from adding up the materials being sent to landfill incinerators and recyclers by all of the uh, commercial transfer stations and MRFs within the five boroughs that are reporting to DEC. Um, obviously, regardless of whether that number is 22 percent, 15 percent, 30-something percent, it's far lower than cities like Seattle, San Jose, San Francisco uh, that are leading on reporting on commercial and residential diversion, um, which, have, uh, which have diversion rates higher than 60 percent, sometimes higher than 70 percent. Um, Commercial waste facilities, many of which are owned by the same corporations that collect commercial waste, uh, are also appear to simply landfill materials that they don't find profitable to recycle. So for example, although we're seeing less glass containers uh, being used, there's still plenty of glass being generated by restaurants, food industry in particular, and a lot of the commercial recyclers and transfer stations simply report recycling zero glass to the DEC. So again, that's publicly available. They seem to just skirt the law where they don't find a way to make a profit on it. Um, so I see that my time's ending. I just want to end by uh, stressing that this is a contrast to the public sector where, as uh, Melissa highlighted, the city has a very successful and hopefully growing program to recycle all of these materials regardless of short-term profitability, including MGP and paper through a long-term con uh, long contract with SIMS. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member 
Chairman Reynoso, uh, I'm Eric Goldstein with the Natural Resources Defense Council. As you know, one of NRDC's high priority goals for New York has been to transform city waste policy from primary reliance on landfilling and incineration to one where recycling, waste prevention, composting, and equitable handling of waste uh, become cornerstones of city policy in the 21st century. The focus of today's hearing uh, is on New York City's zero waste to landfills goal, which NRDC strongly supports. Mayor de Blasio and his Sanitation Commissioner Garcia have been exactly right to set these ambitious targets, and I must say that uh, the Commissioner's uh, testimony today is some of the most encouraging we've heard here in the Council over almost 30 years of testimony on recycling issues from various Sanitation Commissioners. Skeptics argue that a zero waste policy is overambitious, if not unachievable, and therefore we shouldn't set such forward-looking goals. But the naysayers are wrong. These waste goals are being adopted by progressive and even not so progressive municipalities across the country and beyond, among them San Francisco, San Diego, Oakland, Portland, Austin, Dallas, Minneapolis, and Washington, D.C., to name a couple that have adopted zero waste policies. Will New York City achieve these zero waste goals by 2030? Maybe yes, maybe no, but we'll certainly get closer to the goal if we aim for it and follow through with ambitious policy directives than if we don't. The zero waste goal is aspirational. It opens the door for new ideas and different approaches to be tried. And it's a symbol that can inspire the public to adopting new lifestyles that are more sustainable. But it's not going to happen automatically, and that means that the council and the city and all of us who are stakeholders are going to have to act aggressively. And by the way, our definition of zero waste doesn't involve sending any wastes to incinerators or any newfangled combination of uh, waste-burning facilities, which are expensive, pollution-generating, and wasteful of natural resources. There is one other important benefit to achieving and even just striving for the zero waste to landfills gold, and that's jobs creation. According to the, local, uh, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, recycling and composting operations generate five to 10 more jobs per ton of waste than do incinerators or landfills. A consultant, an independent consultant, the TELUS Institute found in California that more than 100,000 jobs could be created in that state if they were to reach an average of 75% recycling and composting. These findings are consistent with a study that was done years ago in New York City uh, where uh, NYU concluded that as many as 4,000 jobs could be created with a major expansion of recycling, and uh, the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest have also forecast new jobs when uh, the commercial sector is reformed. Uh, I, in our testimony, we set forth a dozen recommendations, which I don't have time to read here, but I will quickly try to mention them all to bring us closer to these goals. Uh, the first is that uh, the Council encouraged the de Blasio administration to analyze the potential for jobs creation from a comprehensive expansion of recycling, composting, reuse, and commercial waste reform. Sounds like that's a job for the Economic Development Corporation. Second, we recommend the Council continue to support the citywide organics collection program the Commissioner is implementing. There's probably not a single more important program for getting to zero waste. Third, we recommend the Council take steps to mandate that multifamily building with 10 or more units participate in the city's existing refashioned New York City textile recycling program. Fourth, we recommend that the council collect uh, that as the department's organics collection goes citywide, the council support the department's plans to switch over to single stream recycling. Fifth, we recommend that the council take steps to provide additional funding to support enhanced uh, recycling and education on how and what to recycle at elementary schools throughout the city. Six, we recommend that the City Council intervene to help provide recycling services for the more than 400,000 NYCHA residents by advancing a NYCHA youth jobs program to jumpstart stalled recycling at NYCHA. Seventh, we recommend that the City Council encourage the testing of financial incentives to advance greater recycling and reduce waste generations. That's the save as you throw experiment that the department is contemplating. Eighth, we recommend that the council help facilitate adjustments to sanitation department truck rates, uh, truck collections uh, rates and um, schedules uh, so that the truck routes uh, can take advantage of the fact that we are now having more recycling and composting collections and that, as was testified to earlier, can 
pave the way for reducing the number of regular trash collections. Uh, just three more uh, notes uh, that I will add here. Uh, we recommend the council direct the Department of Citywide Administrative Services in consultation with sanitation to analyze the potential for increasing city purchases of products made with recycled content. We've got to close the loop. Uh, tenth, we recommend that the council take steps to encourage more responsible disposal of problematic wastes, such as electronic wastes, household waste, and unused prescription and non-prescription drugs. Uh, and uh, the, the last two are equally important, even though they're at the bottom of the list. Uh, we encourage the council to consider various kinds of legislation that will actually reduce the amount of waste generated in the first place, including dealing with plastic bags, with polystyrene foam, and by advancing uh, creation of uh, neighborhood swap shops and other ways in which New Yorkers can exchange what is unused or unwanted for them but is still a useful commodity. And then last but not least, just to close the loop on this panel's testimony, uh, we support uh, the council working with the sanitation department to advance legislation to adopt a new zone system for commercial waste handling. We'll never get to zero waste unless we dramatically transform the way in which the overwhelming bulk of city waste, which is commercial waste, is dealt with in a more rational manner. And so we thank you for your attention. Uh, we can't thank you enough for your leadership. We know that if every council member uh, cared about these issues as much as you did, uh, the council would be zooming forward working with the department to achieve these ambitious goals, and we want to do everything we can to support you. Thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate this. I, I just think um, uh, it's very impor imp important that we have information. Of course, visuals always help and work. Um, that was, I didn't think they were going to take the cardboard. Um, that was a surprise. I was like, they'll leave the cardboard. I know that they'll leave it, and they just threw it in there as well. Um, and that's concerning because there's value in that, a lot of value in that. And, um, for that company, I just don't understand the business sense it makes, and it's, it's troubling. So I'm, I was happy to hear from the commissioner that we are going to look into enforcement um, in, a, in, a, in a more effective way, because I know it's happening. Uh, it's not that I see trucks all the time doing it, um, so I'm not, I'm not surprised. I, I hope that just seeing this video makes it so that they can get a violation, because the truck is obviously there, the name of the company is obviously there, and it obviously happened. So maybe there's a way to give them a call and say, hey, stop your nonsense. That would be helpful. I want to talk about two things that I, I didn't bring this up with the commissioner, and I apologize. The single stream, um, how, how you would envision single stream working. A lot of folks are concerned about the contamination of the paper, which is probably the most valuable commodity that comes out of recycling. Um, and uh, whether or not you think that that's an issue at all, that would help. That would help me personally. Um, it's the one thing that I don't know where to put when I have to recycle in my house. It's like, where do I throw this paper? Um, so can you just speak to the single stream and how that would work? Any, anyone, or, of course. And it's, it sounded like you were very aligned to the Department of Sanitation here in most of your recommendations and where you were pushing. Um, but I guarantee no one here works for DSNY. Um, I, I guarantee you, they just are on the same page when it comes to the work that we're doing here. We, we have been historically skeptical of single stream for exactly the reason you note, know, the possibility of contamination. Equipment over the years, however, has improved sorting equipment at facilities. In fact, uh, the commissioner and uh, her team, or a number of us on her team, uh, a number of us uh, as uh, visited uh, a uh, modern uh, MRF on Long Island, uh, and they and others have reported to NRDC that their ability to sort has now improved to such a degree that they are able to separate out the, one of the main problems had been the glass uh, particles which interferes with paper recycling. And the end product of this MRF and others like it from reports we're getting from California are that uh, the contamination is less of a problem now due to the uh, effectiveness of the new technology. Remember, we're talking about single stream recycling and not mixed waste collection. So this is not sorting out the whole uh, kettle of uh, every type of waste, uh, which we don't believe uh, and would lead to high contamination rates. This is just adding in the metals, glass, and plastic and the paper. Thank you for that clarification. Yes, uh, single stream does not mean throw everything in the trash can and it'll be recycled sometime in like 
in a, in a unicorn factory. That's, um, in fact, what the MTA is doing, and we're very skeptical of that uh, for exactly that reason. You, you have one, one more thing I want to get to. Um, it, it speaks to um, the waste prevention uh, role. I, I heard that um, when you enter the organics program, you tend to, uh, once you figure out that most of your garbage is probably organics, that you tend to just be motivated to buy less, let's say, food that you would traditionally throw out um, and just when, when it comes to the food waste work. Can you speak to that um, and the value of, of education through participation in a program like the organics program? Well, I'm happy to say this, 40%, I'm not happy to report these statistics, but 40% of the food uh, that's produced in America is wasted. And getting a, a, and that is also in addition to the fact that we have so many people who are in need of food. Uh, food is the major contributor to emissions of methane from landfills. Landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions in the United States, a very potent global warming gas. So there are a dozen different reasons why reducing the amount of waste makes sense. Also, for every ton that we have to dispose of, it's costing more and more, as the commissioner testified earlier today. One of the benefits of a zero waste policy and the educational efforts that can go with that is that uh, the public uh, is given a greater understanding of the fact that they can save money and they can save the environment uh, by reducing the amount of waste that they generate in the first place. But this is something that the sanitation department can't do alone. Legisl enabling legislation is needed for almost every possible waste reduction effort you would look at, although there is a lot of educational work that needs to be done uh, to make the public aware of why this is an important issue and why they can benefit both economically and from an environmental standpoint. Well, thank you for that information. Yeah, go ahead. Just to add briefly, um, one, one of the things we'd like to see, I think, and, and could be a real uh, source of innovation in the zone system is for the haulers that are going to be responsible for districts to also have some incentive to, to fund or participate or encourage their customers to participate in waste reduction, particularly on the food side. So I think there's some beginnings of this in Los Angeles that we want to look into, but you know, what do food uh, donation programs need in terms of infrastructure? What do they need in terms of outreach? What will make it cost effective for a restaurant or food producer to donate food or, reuse or reduce food waste? Um, and what would align the incentives of the waste haulers with that is something we're, we're excited to look into. Well, well, thank you for that. And I just want to say that progress we make in the commercial waste industry seems to come from reports and legislation being thrusted upon them. Before that, it's usually like a boy who cried wolf from my side. Uh, they don't believe anything I say until we don't have a study or a report, which usually confirms a lot of our concerns. Um, related to truck miles traveled is one example, and then safety being another example. Um, and now, hopefully, seeing this, we won't need to get to a point where uh, uh, they don't partner with us in uh, uh, a zoning system, which I think is going to be very important. Obviously, I think we have numbers of 20 and 30 percent reduction or diversion rates um, if we have a zone collection system. That's a significant number and obviously a very important part of the foundation of getting to zero waste. Um, so I just hope that when that panel comes in uh, that we were talking about being on the same page that the waste uh, collection, the zone system is valuable um, and just hopefully uh, working together to make that happen. But I really appreciate your testimony here today. Oh, actually, uh, Councilman Ben Kalos has questions. So, Councilman Kalos. Thank you for your testimony. First question is, uh, do you believe that zero waste is possible for the city of New York? Uh, by 2030, do you believe that we're on track? Uh, as I indicated earlier, I'm sorry that uh, you missed this piece of our testimony, but we're very glad you're here, Councilmember Kalos. Uh, we are strongly supportive of the goal. We think it's possible to reach the goal. We think that even if the goal is not reached, it's critical that we retain the goal and work towards the goal, and that if we don't have the goal, uh, then we certainly won't reach the goal. And just uh, because I asked the commissioner about it, you alluded to it in your response to Councilmember Reynoso. What is the story with the MTA single 
stream bins that have the label on it that says, don't worry, throw everything in, we'll sort it for you later. We think that's a huge mistake. It's misleading to the public. Uh, and from all the reports we've seen from around the country, mixed waste collection with post-consumer separation for recyclables leads to high rates of contamination. Just think about it. You're tossing in a coffee cup and the Dunkin' Donuts bag, and that's being mixed with potentially good paper that can be recycled. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a foolish way of proceeding. It also confuses the public because you don't want to have different rules for when they're in the subways and when they're at home. It's a terrible policy. We have sought unsuccessfully to convince the MTA of that, but maybe uh, they'd be uh, more receptive to uh, comments from you. In your series of recommendations, uh, number nine relates to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, which I oversee as chair of uh, governmental operations. Do you have draft legislation, and would you be interested in uh, working together on where the Department of Citywide Administrative Services currently is and how far we can go in terms of city procurement? Well, we don't have draft legislation. We'd be happy to work with you on that. For all the council member staffers who are watching Dibs. Uh, now, with regards to the, the 12 recommendations, uh, uh, Chair Reynoso and I work together most of the time when we're not fighting at this committee uh, through a small group of folks, about 18 strong, called the Progressive Caucus. And uh, generally what happens when we have a large list of bills like this, like the stand for tenant safety, is uh, the chair was actually instrumental in uh, working with his legislative director, uh, Lacey, to make sure we, we passed them along. Uh, I guess one big question is a little bit for the chair about which ones of these are you interested in, because I'm interested in a bunch of them. And for those at the table, if we were to try to put together this package of 12 plus maybe some other bills for uh, the Progressive Caucus, how much effort would you be willing to put into getting this passed? Well, speaking for NRDC, this is really uh, a summary, uh, even though it's six pages, of a priority list for the next four years. So obviously it doesn't make sense to move all of these pieces uh, at one time. There are some pieces, uh, for example, a uh, phase-in of um, organics that uh, the, we believe the council should be moving uh, consistently with the department in the scheduling and timetable. The, the idea it, what, on that point in particular, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, they all started with voluntary programs and then at some point years after they worked out the implementation kinks and uh, voluntary became uh, citywide, they made it a mandatory program. We think it makes sense to ultimately convert to that. We're not suggesting that the council advance legislation today to do that. The department needs time to implement uh, what is a, a comprehensive program, uh, and it, it makes sense to do that right and take time. So this really sets out a list of, of priorities for the next four years. We'd be happy to sit down with the Progressive Caucus and uh, work out timetable for some of these things, but I think the most important thing is to recognize that uh, with this, uh, even with Rachel Carson as the commissioner of sanitation, uh, it would be impossible to achieve zero waste without uh, cooperation by the council, and um, we hope that the council will be supportive uh, not only of the commissioner's objectives, but that even the those of us who are uh, in the environmental community and representing uh, constituencies around the city uh, will be a part of the way, uh, a part of the solution in, in prodding the council onto action. I, I will follow uh, our leader and look forward to working with you. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Lacey has submitted every single legislative uh, thought that we've gathered here today, so unfortunately you have access to none of those pieces of legislation. Councilmember Kalos, I do. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, but I agree on two things. I just like the fact that you know, consistently we have answered on whether or not we can achieve uh, zero by 30 the right way, which is um, the goal in itself is ambitious, um, and we're all in to think creatively uh, on how exactly we get there. Um, so I appreciate the consistency across the board here from the advocates and the administration 
um, and, and I just appreciate it. Uh, but thank you for your time. Um, this was great. Thank you for your testimony. And I think we're going to hear from the labor side. Uh, but thank you again. Thank you. I want to call Sean Campbell, uh, Ben Weinstein, uh, Priya, and Mary. I didn't. Some labor. All right, Sean, you want to go ahead and start it, sir? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sean Campbell. I'm the president and principal officer of Teamsters Local 813, representing private sanitation here in New York City and is the largest sanitation union throughout America. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso, for holding this hearing and for being a champion for sanitation workers in your time as ch uh, committee chair. We also would like to thank Councilmember Kalos for the introduction of Intro 1573 and Commissioner Garcia for her leadership in New York City's 2013 Waste Goal. We are in full support of New York City's Zero Waste by 2030 goal. As the men and women who handle our city's trash, we feel the environmental and other impacts more than anyone. The greenest waste facilities in the city, the Department of Sanitation, New Marine Transfer Stations, and the Sims Plant and Sunset Park are both Teamster shops with the best labor conditions, pay, and benefits. We have championed for years for commercial waste zone system to create jobs and dramatically improve jobs in the private sanitation industry where exploitation of workers is rampant. The commercial, wa commercial waste zone system is structured correctly, will require good wages and strong safety programs. Commercial waste zones will also allow the city to finally set diversion goals for commercial carters, which can create a lot of good green jobs for working New Yorkers. Transform Don't Trash New York City recently found that cities with high diversion rates have 60% more recycling jobs than New York City. We calculate that if New York City were to raise its recycling rate to 70%, we would create 3,300 local jobs. But the devil is in the details, and we need a strong policy that holds companies accountable. I can tell you that many sanitation companies still are not recycling a single can or bottle. More than a year after the new recycling reg regulations went into effect, at, company, at companies that do recycle, Private sanitation workers say we need strong worker protections along with diversion goals. Right now, companies often do not hire new workers to collect metal, glass, and plastics. They are giving these additional duties to existing workers on the top of their existing workload. This results in severe overworked employees who are more susceptible to injury and falling asleep at the wheel. New York City can and must reach Zero waste goals. Our members look forward to being partners in a zero waste future. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Priya Mulgaukar, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NIJA has led efforts for comprehensive policy reforms to address solid waste and the impacts of dozens of transfer stations on a handful of low-income communities of color throughout New York City. New York City creates roughly 35,000 tons of garbage every day. Garbage trucks needlessly travel thousands of miles, polluting our air with diesel fuel, clogging our streets, and diminishing our quality of life. These impacts are greatest in those few low-income and communities of color where truck-dependent transfer stations are clustered and along the truck routes used to haul garbage. 
Not surprisingly, these same communities deal with many sources of pollution and the negative health consequences thereof, such as asthma, heart disease, and cancer. Because a number of NIJA's member organizations come from communities overburdened by garbage, we advocate for strong zero waste policies that minimize the impacts of truck traffic and trash in our neighborhoods. One year ago, we released a report with the Transform Don't Trash Coalition that outlined the specific air quality concern of, concerns of overburdened communities in the South Bronx, North Brooklyn, and South Brooklyn. Our volunteers counted waste trucks and collected data on particulate matter associated with diesel exhaust and asthma. Volunteers in the South Bronx at one particularly bad street corner counted 304 commercial trucks per hour, about half of which were commercial waste trucks. That's one commercial waste truck every 24 seconds. The South Bronx also reported between two times and seven times greater the average PM 2.5 pollution for that area. As the city moves forward with its zero waste goals and its new zone system for commercial waste, the mayor's one NYC commitment to equity must direct implementation. We need to advance the long awaited shift from an unjust, polluting truck based system to a cleaner, fairer, zero waste system that fully capitalizes on the new DSNY run marine transfer facilities and more equitably distributes the necessary burden of solid waste management. Commercial waste zoning provides a key opportunity to design a truly zero waste system um, that is more efficient and equitable, distributing the impacts of waste across all the boroughs, not just in low income communities of color. Exclusive collection zones are critical to reducing excessive vehicle miles traveled by trucks and for achieving high diversion rates in an efficient, low cost way. By creating rational commercial districts, haulers can better facilitate separate collection of recyclables, compostable material, um, and garbage without adding to the citywide vehicle miles traveled by collection trucks. Indeed, the 2016 DSNY study of the commercial carting industry's routes found that every neighborhood would likely see a decrease in truck traffic and related emissions, with the greatest VMT reductions occurring in EJ communities in the Bronx and along the BQE and LIE. DSNY should consider using a high standard RFP process for its commercial waste zones to ensure that contracts are awarded to haulers with the strongest proposals for waste diversion, lowering emissions, and redu reduction of negative community impacts. The city should also consider both the locations and community impacts of private truck-based transfer stations that, are, that will be used by commercial haulers when awarding the contracts under a zone system. Each facility could be scored based on criteria such as indoor truck queuing, strict anti-idling policies, and record of compliance with safety and environmental regulations. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. We look forward to continued work to, to working with you uh, toward the complementary goals of equity and zero waste. Hello, I am. Ben Weinstein, I'm a member of a grassroots organization called Clean Up North Brooklyn. We're a group of families, small business owners, and artists fighting for cleaner air quality in Bushwick. Thank you for inviting us to this hearing. Thank you, Councilman Reynoso, for continuing to be an advocate for environmental justice and waste equity in our community. Clean Up North Brooklyn is strongly in favor of the 80 by 50, 0 by 30, and the new organics collection program moving NYC to a more sustainable city. However, we come today with some words of caution. Too often when environmentalists talk about sustainability, the issue of environmental racism is not addressed or included in the vision for attaining sustainability. As you all may know, North Brooklyn is home to many families, schools, playgrounds, and sadly, 19 waste transfer stations handling over 40% of the city's waste as well South Bronx, Southwest Queens, predominantly low-income community of colors have suffered for decades by this waste station clustering. Our communities are saddled with dangerous truck traffic, unbearable stench, so much idling from short and long haulers that it has led to a generation of children with, with chronic respiratory problems. As the organics program expands, these three communities will shoulder the impacts of processing more food waste. 
More food waste means more trucks, more traffic, more idling, more diesel fume, particulate matter, and ultimately more asthma. Getting to zero waste is a unique opportunity for the city to build waste infrastructure in an equitable fashion and help reverse the tide of environmental racism that plagues communities in the outer boroughs. In particular, we recommend better enforcement of private haulers and waste transfer stations. Our community's environmental report, Profits Before Safety, identified 1,200 violations of city and state law in plain sight from a local waste transfer station during one week. However, zero citations were issued by any city or state agency. As DSNY and the City of New York hammer out the rules of moving towards zero waste, they should ask themselves, do we want to repeat the same mistakes made with the closing of fresh kills? Will these same three communities be forced to shoulder the environmental burden of moving towards zero waste? To put it more bluntly, is the zero waste campaign meant to help New Yorkers overall while devastating certain poor communities with diesel fumes, stench, and methane gas emissions? Please look carefully at the closing of fresh kills and the subsequent clustering of waste stations. While everybody wants to send zero waste to landfills by 2030, the burden of getting to zero waste should be distributed equitably to all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I do want to say that in every piece of legislation moving forward regarding getting to zero waste, like even waste, uh, the zoning system, that I'm going to be a very intent or, or deliberate on making sure that that trash gets sent equitably throughout the city and not in our district. We also have intro 495, which the mayor has now supported, publicly supported, um, which is going to allow for us to practically cap um, the, the waste that's coming into our district and not allow for any new waste to come in the way it did with the organics program once that was expanded and the contracts that the city of New York gave to Five Star. You just heard today that the, the commissioner mentioned that they no longer have the organics contract in Five Star and they have actually no DSNY um, uh, trucks coming into the Brooklyn Transfer Station, which is right next to, your, to where you live, um, because that's now going to Hamilton. So as a step in the right direction that we see from the Department of Sanitation, which they committed to, and I'm committed to making sure that, that means we stay that way and that we continue to do that type of work. You. Uh, you're welcome. And then the safety portion. Uh, I want to be clear that uh, outside of an RFP-style system um, in which we move uh, RFP-style, uh, I'm sorry, a zoning system, is the only way we could really push uh, significant safety standards for the workers that we have in the city of New York. Uh, a permit system would be very difficult to make that happen. We have a permit system now that doesn't allow us to really ask for more than what we're getting. So um, again, it's another plus to why we need to make sure that this, uh, this zoning system um, gets kicked off the right way. So I'm very excited about the support that the Teamsters have for that system and agree with you that that is the future um, and also an expansion of workforce over the amount of new recyclable material and infrastructure that would need to be built to handle that recyclable material. So thank you guys for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Um, Sean? Uh, Commissioner, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Chairman, Chair. if I may, one observation I'd like to make and a recommendation, you know, when you have a fire, you don't call a sanitation worker. When you rob a bank, you don't call a firefighter. I believe that in order for a lot of this to work is that the Department of Sanitation needs to really oversee this entire thing. I think that the BIC uh, really doesn't understand sanitation and you know that's just my recommendation and I believe that if sanitation comes in and does the enforcement, I think that a lot of this would work a lot better. Okay, noted. Uh, I'll be bringing that up to BIC. A lot of uh, uh, the, waste, the waste industry might agree with you on that one, um, 100%. But, uh, like, we also have testimony here that there have been about 200 and something violations since August 1st regarding the new uh, organics program within the commercial industry, and that BIC has yet to put one, one, uh, one fine 
to any of those businesses while, again, the Department of Sanitation has about 290 uh, violations. So it's a reflection of the enforcement that's being done by one agency and not the other. So I'll be mindful of it, but I do want to say that BIC's role is a little different than sanitation. No, no I, um, I understand, yeah. and that's noted, but, and I think maybe even that may be wrong because there are summonses being given, it's just not to the right people. A lot of times they're given to my members, the guys who are going out there who are trying to do their job and are forced by their employer to, as you see in the video, uh, throw everything in. Now, obviously that's not the driver's fault, uh, it's the company asking him to do it. Uh, very mi I'll, I'll be mindful of that and make sure that we catch up with the big commissioner on what's happening there. But thank you again for your testimony as usual. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Now we'd like to call up uh, David Biederman, Sarah, Martin, Claire Mifflin. Aliresa Vazari, Vaziri, and Vandra, I can't see that, sorry. Tober. Tober, maybe? It's just, oh, it's just you, Vandra, okay, it's you, all right. All right, Mr. Biederman, would you like to start? Welcome all the way from Washington, D.C. Um, we, we welcome you back. It's nice to see you here every once in a while. Um, and thank you for making the trip. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and check if the mic is on, David. I don't think it's I on. I hope so. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso, uh, Councilman Callos, uh, uh, distinguished guests. My name is David Biederman. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Solid Waste Association of North America, known as SWANA. With more than 9,000 members, we're the largest association in the world for waste and recycling professionals. And our growing New York chapter has more than 350 members. And our New York City members include people who work at the Department of Sanitation, private sector recycling facilities, and many waste and recycling collection companies. SWANA is pleased to testify today about zero waste, an important policy issue that will require engagement from legislators like the City Council, regulators like DSNY, the industry, environmental advocates, and the general population of New York City for the city to be successful in achieving its zero waste goal. Earlier this year, SWANA and the California Resource Recovery Association rolled out the very first zero waste certification course for munis municipal managers and waste industry representatives. From developing the principles and practices that are included in our new course, we know that zero waste has many definitions. To some, zero means no wasted resources. That means zero. To others, zero means no waste to landfills. Zero might mean zero, or it might mean a reduction of 80 to 90 percent by a given target year. And of course, the target years differ depending on municipality. Dozens of municipalities and counties in the United States have zero waste plans or goals, and most of them have different definitions and different target years. SWANA supports all of these diverse efforts, as all of them reduce greenhouse gases, and because local decision making and a commitment to progress are important principles that support successful zero waste initiatives. SWANA fully supports DSNY zero waste plan, which calls for zero waste to landfill by 2030. But we have to acknowledge the difficulty as no major East Coast city diverts even half of their waste from disposal at the present time, and there is not sufficient infrastructure in or near New York City to manage the array of materials that are currently being generated. One of the challenges and also a benefit of zero waste is that it does not rely solely on the development of new processing capacity. Now the waste stream consists of a wide variety of components generated from a diverse variety of sources. This is particularly true in New York City, where 8.5 million New Yorkers generate nearly 12,000 tons of waste every single day, with a similar amount generated by stores, offices, factories, and other businesses. It would be an incredible, historic, and to use a line that someone else said earlier, ambitious accomplishment, to greatly reduce landfill disposal of the millions of tons of waste collected annually by the Department of Sanitation. 
Achieving the city zero waste by 2030 goal means asking all New Yorkers to change their consumption habits, which is much more difficult than passing laws or developing catchy zero waste slogans. The road to zero waste also has to engage manufacturers to change their understanding of a product's end of life and to revisit product packaging. New York City is one of the very few cities with the stature and scale to engage on that level. In addition to increasing recycling, New Yorkers should look for opportunities to donate or share usable items. Zero waste also means encouraging the use and recovery of food to feed people or use for energy recovery and developing new technologies to process and use material diverted from disposal and, and use material diverted from disposal. When food waste uh, is at the 40 to 50 percent level that it is in the United States, much of it occurs before it ever gets to a bin or a container. There's a lot of work that we all can do together to reduce the amount of wasted food and improve the livelihoods of the neediest among us. It, uh, it also may require, from a zero waste perspective, to be successful to increase enforcement, regulation, and costs, which we've heard a little bit about today. Those are not necessarily popular with residents or the business community, which is why it's important for the council to lead in this area. In conclusion, zero waste is a lofty goal, but SWANA, with its national perspective, appreciates the opportunity to testify today and supports the Department of Sanitation's zero waste efforts. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Um, Sarah? Right ahead. Oh, sorry. Should I start over? Oh. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Martin, and I'm the co-chair of the Morningside Heights West Harlem Sanitation Coalition. Our organization is delighted that New York City is working toward the great the goal of zero waste. But, okay, we're most concerned, however, about the New York City Housing Authority. That's the largest landlord in the city. As a 57 year resident of public housing, I had the honor to work with the Sanitation Coalition in developing a most successful recycling program for grand houses in West Harlem. Unfortunately, I saw the unraveling of this program because of neglect by all levels of management, from the chair and the caretakers to grand, at grand houses, and um, well, all of the above. Now, grand houses were set, uh, um, recycling at 30% of our program. This was well above the city average. All right, there are several principles that we have followed which made our program effective. One, the ownership must belong to the residents. They, they need to run it and feel it is theirs to, to, uh, for it to succeed. The second one is the resident leadership of the program must see that every person in the development gets a recycling education. Our organization went floor by floor, building by building, hands-on workshops. Everybody got word of it and wanted to, uh, uh, to participate, to be a great part of it. For recycling to be successful, the recycling leaders must have the cooperation of all levels of, of management and especially the Department of, Edu of uh, Sanitation. We know that the funds are short, but recycling must be a priority of public housing in order to succeed. If our principles are used and put in place properly, moving to zero waste will be possible. Thank you for that, Sarah. And I know that if we all did half the work Grant Houses did, we would be in a much better place. So I thank you for your efforts and your leadership um, in Grant Houses for the work that you've done and setting forth an example as to what everyone else should be doing in NYCHA development. Um, and again, you set forth the motto as to how we should be working there. Thank you. So thank you. Um, now, Sarah from the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board as well. Hello? Better. 
Hi, uh, Sarah Curry Halpern. I'm chair of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. I am testifying for both the Manhattan and Brooklyn swabs. This testimony represents the work of a zero waste oversight uh, hearing task force formed this summer by members of both swabs and other stakeholders and citizen activists. Task force members also wrote three policy briefs being distributed to you today. These papers are on waste management topics that the city needs to consider in light of New York's growing population and continued economic vibrancy. Given the administration's zero waste goals, they are topics of vital concern. The Manhattan and Brooklyn swabs are greatly encouraged by the city's goal to send zero waste to landfills by 2030. However, diverting waste from landfill, while laudable, is not a true measure of achieving zero waste. We therefore urge the city to adopt the Zero Waste International Alliance's definition, which states zero waste is achieving 90 percent diversion from landfills, as well as incinerators and the environment. Incineration should not be included in the city's plan to achieve zero by 30. Given the city's current 25-year contract to supply at least 10,000 tons of waste per week for incineration, the city is contractually blocked from being able to achieve its zero waste goals under ZWIA's globally accepted standard definition of zero waste. How will the city meet the challenge of adapting to a more sustainable definition of zero waste while at the same time honoring the city's existing contracts and planning for the contracts of tomorrow? The zero waste hierarchy is a useful tool to guide new projects and aid in decision making when awarding contracts. Through funding programs that support and promote the more favor favorable methods near the top of the hierarchy, including waste prevention, reuse, composting, and recycling, rather than less desirable methods of incineration and landfill, we will be better suited to achieve true zero waste while creating a healthy city and region. We ask that the swabs and other community stakeholders be involved in these long-range planning discussions, and we encourage the council to get involved, too. The Manhattan and Brooklyn swabs strongly support the reduce, reuse, and recycle programs highlighted in 1NYC. With the amount of waste New York City has, uh, has produced growing since 2015 zero waste commitment, the city needs to develop initiatives specifically aimed at reducing waste generation and begin setting metrics for waste reduction. One great example of this is Green NYC's Stop Junk Mail campaign, which has eliminated 20 million pounds of paper waste since its inception. More creative programs like this, which help improve quality of life while reducing waste, are needed. Only then will we be able to start progressing towards reducing waste and measuring this progress. Um, Council Member K. Lose's intro 1573 echoes the administration's current goals but could go further. The city already has policies and programs to foster recycling, reuse, and composting. We ask the council to work with the Department of Sanitation and the mayor's office to develop legislation that codifies waste reduction, reuse, and composting metrics, sets measurable targets, and requires regular reporting to the public on these metrics. We see a need for more robust quantification of waste metrics so that we can accurately gauge progress and create targeted solutions um, that will help us achieve true waste by 2030. Intro 1573 states a 100% diversion from landfill goal, which we, the members of the SWABs, advise to be reduced to the more internationally accepted rate of 90%. Not everything in our waste stream can be reused or recycled safely, and it is dangerous economic policy to require recycling at any cost when often markets do not exist for many recycled materials. 90% diversion is a more universally held and attainable goal, recognizing that while re recycling is a necessary component of a zero waste plan, it is also very resource intensive. We also recommend adding a more practical waste reduction target to this legislation, such as reduce the amount of waste disposed by 75% by 2030 from a 2005 baseline. Other cities with aggressive zero waste plans, such as San Francisco and Austin, have robust incentive programs and large enforcement teams issuing penalties for lack of compliance, helping them move the needle. Programs like Save As You Throw, when introduced in New York City, will presumably offer residents incentives to reduce waste and divert more. But incentives and programs to engage residents and businesses should not stop there. Department of Sanitation also needs to make regular increases in its enforcement team in order to hold all businesses and residents accountable to our recycling and organics rules and laws. We think City Council would agree that increasing recycling and organics collection capacity will not on its own get people to separate recyclables and organics from their trash. Changing personal behavior has always been a public policy challenge. Seatbelts, condoms, even the position our babies sleep in all needed aggressive outreach campaigns to educate the public. The Manhattan and Brooklyn swabs see the behavior change needed for New Yorkers to reduce, reuse, and recycle as something that can be successfully influ influenced through an ongoing awareness campaign and educational program. 
Um, I'll just uh, finish with one other uh, thought. We would also like to see the city expand the Zero Waste Steering Committee or create a new Zero Waste Task Force that includes not only employees of city agencies and mayor's office working on the Zero Waste Program and policies, but also people from a broad range of backgrounds who play a part in helping the city achieve zero waste. This task force should be transparent and collaborative, reporting publicly on the city's progress towards zero waste while developing creative solutions to the difficult hurdles we will face while trying to reach these goals. Um, uh, in, in summation, I'd just like to thank Council for the, uh, this oversight hearing and the opportunity to have a robust discussion on what it will take to get the city to zero waste by 2030. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Vandra, you want to go ahead? Um, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vandra Thorburn. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify before this committee today uh, regarding the intro uh, 1573 and just to including the threat that reaching zero waste by uh, 2030 might not happen. Um, I, see, I agree with everybody else that whether it doesn't happen or not, we should be, the, we should be um, marching towards it anyway. So I'm the founder of Okashi Kitchen Waste Solution, a unique composting service in New York City that is now eight years old. Through this compost collection service, I have demonstrated the viability of using an alternative low-tech solution to the zillions of paper bags involved in organic waste collection. We have shown the profound efficacy of the five-gallon bucket and introduced the Japanese method of fermenting food scraps as the cleanest, safest, and most environmentally friendly and cost-effective way of managing incidental food waste. We collect food scraps from households, offices, small businesses with kitchenettes and pantries, and compost at public and private gardens. I have testified many times before this committee to get support for community-based, small and medium-sized composting facilities. Today, I am again pleading for the support for the growth of the micro haulers in the waste uh, sector and for encouraging the, the growth of these community-based initiatives that I think help get us to um, uh, zero waste. For far too long, the waste sector has been monopolized by large government agencies and corporate waste management enterprises. And as you know, in the Comptroller's 2016 report card on MWBE participation in city agency procurements, BIC got an F and DSNY got an F. We need contracts between the city and haulers to focus on the significant opportunity to boost MWBE participation in this industry that has very high barriers to entry and participation. And I urge this committee to look at actually the um, requirements in the Los Angeles uh, Recycle LA and how beneficial that's been to local MWBE um, enterprises. So last year, the mayor's official 80 times uh, 50 plan was released, the waste section suggested there might be some light in this tunnel. Um, the report re references the private carting study and the commit commitment of DASNY and BIC to work to, with the broad range of stakeholders, including the businesses and the private carting industry, um, and the environmental justice advocates to uh, develop an implementation plan for the commercial waste uh, reform. And I'm here to, and the, basically I'd like to just end here by um, urging you and um, DASNY and uh, the um, waste hauling uh, community to really encourage the growth of small industrial solutions. As they say, it's a thousand points of light that are needed so much as we, the, I think the greatest way of 
encouraging participation is to get more people participating and a front line of that is to make sure that there are community-based businesses. Thank you. Right. Thank you for your testimony. Claire Mifflin. Hello, my name's Claire Mifflin and I'm an architect leading the process of developing the AIA New York, um, that's the American Institute of Architects, Zero Waste Design Guidelines. This has been a year-long process. We, we got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, and we're, we're about to launch these design guidelines which help um, architects and designers change buildings to better separate our waste. We've visited over 50 buildings. We've had five workshops with staff from DSMY, city planning, Department of Transportation, and other city agencies along with developers, building managers and porters, architects, urban designers, and more. It's clear that the way our buildings are set up here in this dense city and the way we set out our waste for collection play a crucial role in getting to zero waste. We heard Brad Lander say that multifamily buildings have unique challenges in separating organics. We've seen in other cities like San Francisco and Milan, they've actually ended up shutting down chutes so they can have organics collection in the same place as their trash collection. But in New York City, chutes are required by code and there's a whole lot more of them. And so we don't know if that is the right solution here, but clearly more work needs to be done so organics um, diversion can be much higher. These guidelines will be launched, as I said, October 18th, and then the grant funding is complete, apart from the exhibition at the Center for Architecture next summer. The guidelines contain many strategies that designers and building managers can use immediately, but also contain many other ideas that need to be piloted, evaluated, and will require code changes or policy changes to implement. Further research needs to be done to provide evidence to determine how best to implement the strategies for managing waste and which codes or policies need to be changed. In high-density neighborhoods with small sidewalks, the best solutions may be on the street rather than the sidewalk and may include permanent shared waste collection infrastructure. Planning at a neighborhood scale is required to develop many of these solutions. The momentum building during development of the guidelines has been powerful and we've been impressed to see the level of engagement and collaboration between agencies and other stakeholders. This process should continue in an ongoing process to determine how the design of our buildings and sidewalks need to be modified to enable our city to achieve zero waste. Achieving zero waste will not be easy and I re recommend that the city sets up a working group of representatives from multiple agencies and the private sector, so architects, developers, urban planners and building operators to continue the work of implementing the suggestions of the zero waste design guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. And Ali Reza? Hello. Uh, my name is Ali Reza Vaziri, and I'm the co-founder of Rojo Compost. Uh, we are a food waste nonprofit in New York City. Uh, to date, we have composted over a half a million pounds of food waste and have donated over 1,500 pounds of edible food to local shelters and food banks in New York City. In our work, we have discovered many forms of corruption throughout the waste hauling uh, business. One of the most alarming issues is private waste haulers inflating the amount of waste they pick up from their clients. Uh, the amount of waste in pounds or in volume from their restaurants, supermarkets, or businesses that they pick up from. The Business Integrity Commission has mandated maximum rates a private hauler can charge per weight or volume, or, or, or volume of waste. This system allows BIC to regulate how much waste is being charged to have its, how much a business is being charged to have its garbage removed. However, to our, to our knowledge, BIC does not have guidelines or mandates on how a waste hauler weighs its customer's trash. In many case, cases, I have noticed through our own conducted waste audits that a hauler will, provi will provide low rates per pound of yard, per pound or, or yard of waste, uh, inflating a business's overall waste numbers. In these instances, a business owner thinks that they're getting a great deal because they're getting a, lo a low rate, 
per pound or per volume. However, their overall waste numbers are inflated. Uh, this allows the, the business, the, the garbage hauler, to make up, uh, make up the, um, make up their margins and make more money. This type of practice increases. Uh, this type of practice creates difficulties competing in the waste waste industry, and puts the onerous on the business owner to monitor its garbage hauler. When in reality, a business owner has a million other things to do. I am seeking more involvement from BIC and others to create regulations that provide for more transparent forms of weighing trash, recyclables, and food waste. Technology exists that can assist businesses and haulers with these measures and efforts. At ROHO, we, we weigh each tote and bag individually, providing accurate numbers for our businesses. As a business owner, the amount of waste you produce should fluctuate from season to season. Some months you are busy, some months you are slow. This is not happening. In my opinion, in order to achieve zero waste, we must provide financial incentives for businesses to compost and recycle and to even donate food. This includes placing a price for landfilling, recycling, food donation, and composting with each stage of programming at a lower rate. So we would have a lower rate for landfilling, a, low, uh, a, higher, a high rate for landfilling, a lower rate for recycling, a lower rate for composting, and a low rate for food donation. Finally, I'd like to raise the issue of transparency involved in, involved in composting to go where. This includes utensils, cups, and plates. Many businesses believe that these products are being composted, yet it, yet it has still been, it is still unknown where these to-go materials are actually being composted. In some instances, these to-go where compostables are being commingled with other forms of trash, like recyclables um, and glass. Uh, we believe that these, these compostable to-go ware is being landfilled and businesses are being lied to, paying more money for compostable to-go ware. I support and applaud these, uh, I, support, I support and applaud this committee's efforts and we hope that you can continue in, in helping us as a city achieve our goals of reaching zero waste by 2030. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony to the panel. I just want to say several folks spoke to some way that they could get more involved with the Department of Sanitation through some type of committee or task force. Um, and I really want to look into that to see if we could, we could have that discussion. Um, and also uh, speaking to food donations and, and food waste in general and how that can be a part, a part of this. I don't think we, we talked about it too much when the DSNY was here but I know that they have a robust food waste um, initiative and operation that they're working towards so that we can handle the garbage before it even gets to our plate um, uh, and really try to change habits of the consumer um, and deal with it in the front end, not the back end. So I really appreciate your time um, and your testimony today uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. We have uh, Mary Cleaver, sorry, yes, hello. Rolando Guzman, Greg Todd, and Alessandro Ciari. All right, and then we'll have to, actually, let me keep that. Well, they're going to go up there. All right, so this is our second to last panel. So I'd like to go, um, I'm sorry. So you wanna start from left to right? Orlando, go first and then, all right. From your right to left. Okay. Uh, Sandra? Chairman Osa, if I may ask to go for, I have an appointment I have to- No, leave. absolutely, I apologize I, for that. No, sure. Go ahead. No problem, thank you for that uh, consideration. Um, good afternoon, um, Chairman Reynoso. 
Um, my name is Greg Todd. I'm a member of the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board and a chair of the Organics Committee. And as we know, the mayor has set a goal of zero waste to landfills by 2030. While this is certainly an awesome goal, I find it very difficult to believe we're going to get there given the current level of outreach on the sanitation department and the mayor's pro-real estate development policies. Uh, two months ago, a deputy commissioner from sanitation made a very well put presentation about the zero waste program to the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board. Yet when I asked him if we could get a copy to take out to the community, the speaker said he wouldn't be possible as the subject might change. Um, I would really like to get a copy of that presentation. I think it's very important that we collaborate with uh, sanitation as volunteers to help them get the word out. Uh, BSWAB set itself the goal of reaching out to every one of the 18 community boards in Brooklyn to tell them about zero waste. To do that, we need a clean, short, and compelling presentation from sanitation department. I'm here to ask for that presentation. A goal I am proposing with the Organics Committee at SWAB is to create a medium-scale composting center in each of our 18 community boards in Brooklyn. At present, we have just two, the Red Hook Composting Center and the soon-to-be-renovated Gowanus Conservancy site, both in CB6. Citywide, we have just the Earth Matters site on Governor's Island and the big reuse site under the Queensboro Koch Bridge. By putting similar sites in each of the 18 community boards, we can achieve a number of goals. Number one, give tangible, tangible evidence that organics soon to be collected citywide are actually being composted. Anecdotal evidence suggests that many residents and even sanitation workers still believe these materials are simply going into landfills. One way to counteract this belief is to have a community-based composting or anaerobic digester that residents can see sanitation trucks going into and that can be visited by community groups, school science classes, merchants associations, and other interested parties. Two, create real proof waste is actually a resource that it can be beneficially reused. As we say in Brooklyn, seeing is believing. An actual facility in our community will say far more than an infant number of PowerPoints that we're actually reusing this compost. And finally, provide some green jobs for composters, community gardeners, and other greenies. While there is much hype about green jobs and the circular economy, having compost and anaerobic digesters that can handle five tons of organic a day, which is what we're defining as medium scale, in each of our 18 communities will actually build a foundation around the hype. Now, I just want to cut short the rest of my comments and simply say we need to make sure we have land in our communities to do this composting. And I would ask that the Mayor's Office of Sustainability um, attempt to identify and put a freeze on potential M1 sites in our neighborhood so that we have locations for these proposed medium-scale composting facilities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, um, Council Member uh, Reynoso. Uh, my name is uh, Rolando Guzman, and I'm here on behalf of the Organizations United for Trash Reduction and Garbage Equity Outreach. We are a coalition of local community organizations in North Brooklyn that we advocate and we organize community members, especially the long-term um, uh, Latino and African-American com community members around environmental justice issues, especially waste reduction, garbage equity, and truck traffic safety. As you know very well, North Brooklyn, along with other two communities in New York City, process almost New York City garbage. Uh, this is another example of the historic um, racial and economic discrimination almost uh, towards um, communities of uh, color and low-income families. 
Um, we are here, though, supporting this goal to reduce waste to zero by 2030. We believe this is now not only achievable, this is the right thing to do for our communities and also is the best thing to do to stop global warming uh, in the world. Also, we applaud and we celebrate the commitment of the current administration when it comes to waste reduction. Uh, we also believe that the city can do several things right now to ensure that we are walking or going towards the right way for waste reduction and ensure garbage equity. And the first thing that we recommend is to ensure that there is garbage equity. So uh, we are urging again City Council uh, to pass intro 495. That is going to produce relief to communities like ours in Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and Bushwick, but also it's gonna ensure that other communities in New York City don't get over overburned with um, a high concentration of waste transfer stations in their community. Uh, the other item that we believe the city can be doing right now is increase, increase the number of materials that can be recycled. Uh, New York City, uh, when it comes to recycle, I think many people brought it up before, we are so behind in other large cities and also small municipalities throughout the country. And that I don't think that's uh, totally acceptable. Uh, we believe the organic collection is a great pilot and we believe that the city should be increasing that. Uh, also, we believe that the city should do more enforcement. Uh, they should do enforcement, especially to the private carding companies. Uh, what you saw in that video uh, is something that we've been blowing the horn for a long time in North Brooklyn, and especially with restaurants and bars. It's kind of ironic that a bar produces so many beer bottles and everything goes to the same truck, goes to the same transfer station, ends up in the same landfill. Something just to add though, uh, we are doing research with local businesses and they believe that carding companies are recycling and some of them are actually paying extra thinking that they are recycling. So this is an issue not only about environmental justice but also a consumer protection that some of these people are paying for a service that they are not getting. Uh, we also believe that the city can do a better job when it comes to enforcing those trucks. You know very well in North Brooklyn we have several cyclists that are getting killed uh, in regular basis, sadly enough, by truck uh, carting companies. Uh, the city should do a better enforcement when it comes to truck enforcement. And also, the city should enforce or ask that those trucks are cleaner. Uh, we have the, one of the highest concentrations of asthma in New York City, and that is due especially thanks to these collection trucks. Uh, we also believe that the uh, banning the plastic bags it's only right and only uh, necessary for the city. And uh, it's great that the uh, governor is um, putting together this task force, but I don't think we should be waiting on that. And I think the city council has a responsibility to all the communities that are getting affected with this burden to address that issue. The other issue that we really uh, want to stress is that if there is this um, zero waste steering committee, uh, it has to have a meaningful and true participation of local community organizations, uh, not only uh, from advocates or um, intellectuals, but at the same time, grassroots organizations in those communities to be part of this. Uh, we believe those are steps that the city can be doing right now. Uh, 2030 is way ahead of us, but those are steps that the city can be taking right now and it's gonna ensure that we get to a place where we have zero waste and also more uh, waste equity in the city of New York. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rolando. Mary? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Committee Chairman Reynoso and others in attendance for your time today. I'm Mary Cleaver, owner of the Cleaver Company and the Green Table. We are catering an event planning business dedicated to creating and producing high quality events while striving to improve the food supply. We also have a farm to table restaurant called the Green Table and operate two kiosks at the battery known as Table Green during the six warmer months of the year. For more than 35 years, we've been committed to creating a healthy, sustainable local food and farm economy. We care about where our food comes from sourcing seasonal ingredients from responsible local farmers and producers. But we also care about where it goes. We train our kitchen and our off-premise catering staff to always separate waste into recycling, compostable, and landfill waste. Our primary strategy on waste is not to create it in the first place. Through the years, we've been outspoken advocates for handling commercial waste in a responsible manner that is good for the environment. 
We pushed to begin commercial composting in the Chelsea market where our commissary is located and where many other food businesses are tenants. We enthusiastically joined the Mayor's Food Waste Challenge in the spring of 2013, and we were here before City Council to support the 2013 Commercial Food Waste Law. We welcome Commissioner Garcia and DSNY's recent and gratefully ambitious initiatives to help move the whole city closer towards the vision of zero waste to landfill by 2030. This includes the application and enforcement of recycling laws to businesses, commercial and mixed-use buildings, as well as residential units, so that all businesses are required to responsibly and systematically separate their waste. However, it is concerning that while stores and restaurants across the city are now diligently separating their waste streams, there continues to be a lack of transparency around where this waste is taken and the extent to which it is actually being recycled and composted. We just don't know what happens to the recyclables and other compostable materials we can conscientiously separate and return from events we produce around the city after it is taken from the loading dock by our hauling company. A year ago, the Chelsea Market did proactively consolidate the building's waste to one loading dock and installed a biodigester. So we now separate in four streams, organic waste, vegetable straps, ex scraps acceptable to the biodigester, industrial composting such as meat and chicken bones, fish carcasses, citrus, paper towels, and compostable serveware, recyclables, and landfill. We had to insist on the recycling as it was not common practice, and I'm happy to say that it is in full effect. But more often than not, the biodigester is non-functioning. This means that although we continue to separate accordingly in our kitchen, on the dock we must consolidate these composting streams once again, with all compostable matter going into the industrial compostable bins. To the best of my knowledge, this is then taken hauled to the Newtown Creek Waste Water Digester Egg in Greenpoint. The second problem for customers is that the pricing system lacks transparency and consistency. It is very difficult to know if you are getting a fair rate for waste hauling, and often businesses along the same street pay different rates to the same hauler. As part of the consortium of Chelsea Market, we now pay slightly less than we did as a single business pickup. But as we plan our move from Chelsea after 21 years to an affordable space in one of the outer boroughs, we do not know what to expect or how to negotiate waste pickup at our next location. As Commissioner Garcia reported, the system also operates differently for large and small businesses. While large businesses are able to negotiate their contracts with carters and adjust prices on the basis of how much waste they generate, small businesses have far less bargaining power. Studies have found that over 60% of New York City small businesses do not have a written contract with their waste hauler, which leave them at the hauler's whim with respect to price increases, while 90% pay a flat rate for waste collection disconnected from the amount of waste they generate. Additionally, there is a lack of infrastructure for compost in the city and its environs. As far as I know, since the Peninsula Composting Facility was shut down by the State of Delaware in 2015, there is now only one commercial composting facility available to some of the New York City haulers. We would like to see far greater investment in this infrastructure, which in turn will bring the creation of good green jobs. There are many farms, particularly dairy farms, in neighboring counties who have no succession plan or cannot afford to stay in business. It seems to me that we could help the regional farm and food economy by creating organic composting facilities on nearby farms to help families keep the land in some form of agricultural use. We are hopeful that the reforms underway will provide a major opportunity to address the problems with New York City's commercial waste system across the board by enabling a robust, transparent composting and recycling system fair, consistent, and transparent pricing for all businesses of all sizes and the creation of green jobs. Thank you so much for your time. Cassandra? Hello, Committee Chair. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for holding the zero waste hearing. It's really important to have this in order to push forward the discussion in New York City. Thank you so much. What I have, I come from the Manhattan Swab and also Brooklyn Swab. I volunteer for both. And what I have here is an EP, uh, a policy brief focused on the EPS of the polystyrene ban and also uh, focusing on 1480 and also 1596. And um, what this also serves as is a letter uh, showing the support of different businesses in New York City for the ban on polystyrene. The undersigned food service establishments and other businesses have joined together to strongly oppose intro 1480 
a bill that would designate poly expanded polystyrene, commonly known as styrofoam, as recyclable. The restaurant and business communities have voiced instead to support intro 1596, a bill to restrict the sale and use of EPS foam food containers in New York City. A ban of EPS is the only solution to stem the tide of the major public health problems of EPS use, disposal, and contamination. The New York City Department of Sanitation recently concluded that, the recy that recycling polystyrene foam in New York City cannot be accomplished in an economically feasible and environmentally effective manner. In addition, the extensive, extensive shipment and collection of EPS disproportionately impacts low-income and communities of color where truck-dependent transfer stations are clustered and along the truck routes used to haul garbage. The, to achieve waste equity and environmental justice, New York City needs strong policies to minimize the impact of traffic and pollution in these neighborhoods. Like you had mentioned before, New York City is facing extremely terrible rates of asthma, and this is one of the ways to help stem that issue, to help fix that. It is highly attainable for food service establishments to use alternatives to EPS containers, as there are many alternatives to EPS that can be recycled properly, such as paper products, cardboard, and reusable plastic containers. After the previous 2013 City Council proceedings to ban EPS in New York City, many food service establishments have already, re have already removed these products from their food packaging order inventory in order to serve current consumer demands and to stay ahead of the law. One of the first questions that I get from anybody regarding this ban is, hasn't it already been banned yet? So there already is a shift going away from styrofoam in New York City, without a doubt. In order to have an equitable transition to an EPS ban, intro 1596 details how certain businesses can apply for a renewable financial hardship waiver. This will, uh, this will provide ample time for those to find alternatives to EPS products at an, affordable, at an affordable cost. Now, according to Trash Free Waters Maryland, who evaluates the effect of and the impact of the EPS ban in, in the Washington, D.C. area, every business has been able to find an affordable alternative, and not one business has applied for a waiver. Not one. With the progress already made in New York City and the rest of the country already, there should be no concern for making a successful transition. The undersigned businesses in the rest of the packet that I gave you stand up to the plastics foam lobby to defend the true interests of New York City. The purpose of banning EPS is to contribute to one of the goals of 1NYC, which is for New York City to reach zero waste by 2030. If we are to step forward with more sustainable materials, we will be taking a step forward in being a healthy and more lasting society. And uh, in addition to this, this letter, which has 68 businesses uh, signed on, a majority of which are small businesses, local businesses uh, that are from different boroughs all over New York City, Queens, Upper Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn as well. They've, they've shown a lot of support for this and shown that they've already started to use other alternatives. And currently we need, and we also have another sign-on letter that we've already submitted in the past of 50 different organizations that also support the ban on styrofoam. And we have already surpassed what the Plastics Foam Lobby had already submitted as uh, supporting restaurants. We have surpassed that support. And currently there are 13 sponsors for city council, of City Council for 1596 for the ban. And there are currently 16 sponsors for the City Council for 1480, the one that we are opposing. And we really look forward to that changing and working with more me members of City Council to make sure that this is going to be banned in the near future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. As we all know, achieving zero waste is going to, uh, we're going to have to really think about how we do polystyrene and also uh, plastic bags. Those are going to be big parts of it. So I appreciate your testimony. Thank you so much for your testimony to the panel. And now for our last panel here, uh, we have Jacqueline Altman, uh, Maggie Clark, and Adriana Espinoza.
From your right to left, there you go. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the manager. Is the button on? Yep. Can, Can you, you just bring it closer to yourself? Yes, thank you. Sure, sure. It's better. Okay, um, my name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the manager of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, we'd like to thank Chair Reynoso and members of the Sanitation Committee for holding this important hearing on reaching our city's goal of zero waste to landfills by 2030. This, this goal will require work from all New Yorkers, cooperation of city officials, private industry, and buy-in from the general public. As of fiscal year 2017, curbside re recycling rates are approximately 17.5%. While this is an increase from 2005, it's moving far too slowly to reach the 2030 benchmark of 90%. More aggressive actions are necessary to keep us on track. The New York League of Conservation Voters suggests the focus on the following areas. First, invest in public education. To improve below target diversion rates for recyclables and organic waste, the city must invest heavily in massive public education campaign. Current marketing for Vision Zero should serve as a template. This outreach should teach New Yorkers how to properly sort recycle, recyclables and organics, but focusing solely on how is not enough. The campaign should explain why these changes are necessary and make a direct connection to the city's sustainability goals. In addition to traditional marketing, the city should expand its targeted outreach. In particular, maintenance staff in large buildings should be seen as key ambassadors. Sustainability training for this sector could have an exponential impact on diversion rates. Finally, child and youth engagement is key. The earlier we can instill the importance of eco-friendly uh, behavior, the more likely they are to carry it into adulthood. Next, triggering behavior change. Diverting organic waste from landfills is a critical component of zero by 30, as organics represents 31% of residential waste stream. To date, however, participation rates are strikingly low, and city blocks sprinkled with a dozen of half-empty brown bins seems to be like a remarkably inefficient way to collect the waste. The prospect of disposing of organics through our sink should be fully explored as an easier process that could lead to much higher participation rates and lower emissions than curbside pickup. In 2015, and YLCV's Education Fund released a series of policy recommendations for an effective organic waste program. These recommendations ask the city to maximize the use of anaerobic digestion at DEP's wastewater treatment plants. We urge the Department of Sanitation to work with DEP to make provisions for high quality organic waste similar to the capacity at Newtown Creek at other wastewater treatment plants that could accommodate such material. There are also two programs currently being studied that have great potential for reducing waste sent to landfills and emissions from truck traffic. Uh, first is pursuing franchise zones for commercial waste carters that will result in significantly reduced truck traffic and their associated emissions and a volume-based save-as-you-throw pricing system it would provide an economic incentive for generating less waste and recycling more and stimulating demand. Making substantial progress on diversion rates is futile without regional processing capacity and demand for processed recyclables and, and compost. More focus is needed on developing capacity and incentivizing the private sector to invest in practices like anaerobic digestion at their existing facilities. The city can lead by example in this respect by investing in their own anaerobic digestion. Biogas produced from this could be used to fuel the Department of Sanitation's fleet, therefore reducing diesel emissions around the city. With the expansion of the city's organics program, there will be an abundance of compost and biogas available. The city should plan ahead for this with policies that can align the demand with supply. A low carbon fuel standard is just one example that can spur the demand for biogas. I'd like to thank Chair Reynoso and the entire Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management for your leadership, and I look forward to working with you all closely moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, I appreciate it. I'm Maggie Clark, PhD, founder of Zero Waste New York, and also on the uh, National Recycling Coalition's Disaster Debris Mitigation Committee, and chair of the Waste Prevention Committee of the Manhattan Swab. Uh, by the way, uh, since um, Council Member uh, Kalos was interested in, uh, in new ideas, uh, the Waste Prevention Committee has a long list of ideas for waste prevention legislation. I hope you're interested too. Good. Um, and I thank you also for having this zero waste hearing, and I hope you'll follow up with DSNY on their metrics uh, to see how we are progressing program by cro program uh, as we move through time. In the past, I'm, I'm going to speak to you about something that nobody else covers. 
In the past, disasters have always meant unplanned, uncoordinated, and hasty reactions to natural and man-made disasters, resulting in huge amounts of misallocated resources, but it doesn't have to be that way. Zero waste principles applied before a disaster strikes and after can massively reduce wasted resources and save lives. So what can we do towards zero waste disasters? First, we have to respect that flood zones are areas that will, with certainty, be flooded, create storm debris and possibly loss of life. The three steps to zero waste in disasters are prevent generation of disaster debris, maximize reuse, recycling, and composting after disasters, and minimize disposal and export of waste after disasters. So why do we want to reduce waste from hurricanes and flooding? Just to be more specific, we're in that season now. Flooding is getting worse, not only because of climate change, but the existence of buildings and streets in the floodplain prevents infiltration of the water and makes water go higher and farther. The cost in dollars and lives is higher with every new disaster uh, because we are building more and more in flood zones. We must stop building in the flood zones. How do we prevent waste in disasters? Prevention is the most effective way to manage a disaster. We need to be prepared before it happens. New York needs to create a plan to stop building more structures in the floodplains. We need a law and zoning that supports this. Many localities have such legislation, including Jacksonville, Sacramento, and Los Angeles, according to the American Planning Association. Then we need to stop rebuilding in flood zones after disasters. Instead, we should institute programs that cover the entire 100-year flood zone that enforces a government buyout of damaged properties rather than the spotty voluntary buyouts that occurred in a few places like Staten Island after S Sandy. It's insane to keep rebuilding. Finally, we need to create a plan to reuse, recycle, and compost as much as possible so we're ready when the next storm hits. We need to educate the public to have separate debris piles at the curb to enable recycling and composting of as much waste as possible. Vegetative debris, metal, hazardous waste, uh, electronics are a few. The city needs to have pre-planned contracts to go into effect to collect the separate resource streams and bring them to market. For what is left, the city should not engage in the highly polluting open burning as was done at Floyd Bennett Field after Sandy. I have more information for you in the two uh, references that I put there in the written copy. I hope the council can ask DSNY for data on what percentage of disaster waste is reused, recycled, and composted and to set up educational, con contractual, and infrastructure programs to address this. And finally, just to respond to what I heard earlier today, to reach zero waste, we must strive for 100% participation as well as 100% targeting. DSNY reports that they spend about 53 cents per capita on education. I did the math. They don't see that they're in competition with the advertising industry that spends billions to get people to buy more and more all the time. DSNY needs to work seriously towards 100 percent participation, not 53 cents per person. That's not even, what is that, the cost of a postage stamp. So thank you again, and I, I hope that this will be the first of many zero-waste hearings. It will. It will be. Thank you for this information. We're going to try to get into more detail in the future um, as to what parts of zero waste we want to pay attention to and really hammer home, and uh, we'll see what that looks like in the, in the coming months. But thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and distinguished guests. My name is Jackie Ottman. I'm an expert in the area of green marketing. My 40 years of experience includes over a decade working at New York City advertising agencies. The Department of Sanitation has in place many laudable programs to make it easy for residents to divert a host of recyclable items from the waste stream. However, infrastructure alone cannot guarantee compliance, and neither can the stick of enforcement. As you, Chairman, and others have stated today, 
New York City's 8.5 million residents and millions of tourists and visitors must be motivated to recycle and take other steps to reduce waste. Only a massive advertising, marketing, and outreach campaign can reinforce the why and how necessary to make reduce, reuse, and recycle a core value of our consumption culture. Planning for such a campaign must begin with an updated understanding of what New Yorkers know and feel about the city's recycling program. Surprisingly, if not shockingly, no large-scale market research has been conducted since 2005 to track New Yorkers' recycling-related awareness, attitudes, understanding, and habits. In the interim, much has changed. Many more items are now being collected for recycling, including organics. 400,000 NYCHA residents and employees of large firms have access to recycling, but little relevant education. And a new generation of recyclers has grown up without the social force of a public campaign. Meanwhile, and I want to really underscore this, Attitudes have changed, some with the potential to seriously undermine our efforts to get to zero waste. Recently published market research shows that skepticism runs high, especially among millennials, that whatever is collected for recycling will actually be recycled. Research also shows that recycling can actually encourage consumers to waste. Want to feel less guilty about buying bottled water? Easy, just remind yourself that bottle is recyclable. There's hope. We here in New York City have what it takes to develop a compelling marketing and outreach campaign and for a fraction of the $400 million we spend each year to export our waste. Our advertising and media community is capable of tapping into New Yorkers' pride that ours is the greatest city in the world. The long-running I Love New York campaign is proof the creativity and environmental passions of today's millennials can be enlisted to create viral-bound videos, hashtags, imagery, and more that can make the daily and unseemly aspects of sorting our waste cool. Three other opportunities for, to outreach cost-effectively also exist. Local businesses, thanks to changes in commercial recycling laws, local employers have a new role to play in engaging their employees in proper recycling and waste reduction practices. Opportunities may exist to leverage their training budgets to require compulsory recycling education for large New York City employers with resultant learning transported into homes and families. Local schools. Waste education could be integrated into STEM education with the goal of instilling in students a sense for the issues involved in wasting food as well as other resources including water. Waste reduction and recycling and reuse should be explicitly linked to carbon balance and climate change lessons. Real estate sector, lease agreements requiring acknowledgement of recycling laws could become mandatory. An opportunity may also exist to make recycling education mandatory for property managers, landlords, co-op and condo boards, and building superintendents. Who should be responsible? We believe the Mayor's Office of Sustainability's Green NYC Group would be ideally suited to overseeing such a campaign. It can all start by convening a high-level, zero-waste marketing advertising advertise, advers, advisory board, including senior executives, both active and retired, of major firms capable of helping us to tap into the best talent in the city. For the record, I'm submitting this testimony with more details and ideas attached. Thanks for allowing me to submit this testimony. Thank you for having this hearing. Thank you so much. Is, uh, that was the last piece of testimony here. Thank you so much for this hearing. You guys are amazing. Uh, and now this meeting is adjourned. All right. Well, let's hope it does some good. Can I talk to you for a sec? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I, I was wondering. Oh, I can't turn it off.